regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of Socorro ISD will be held Tuesday, September 20th, 2022, and the time is 6.05. If, if you will please, I officially call this, this meeting to order, and we have established a quorum. And we will say our Pledge of Allegiance. We have Oliver Munoz, an eighth grader from Hernando Middle School, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Oliver? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, one individual, who liberty is our children. At this time, we're moving into item number three, the superintendent's comments. Dr. Carmen. Thank you, Mr. Mena. Good evening to you and the board, members of the board, and to our Socorro ISD community. Do have some new uh, personnel introductions for our new leaders at Socorro ISD. I would like to first welcome Rebecca Parada as the new principal of Bill Seibert Pre-K-8 School. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome Lorenzo Lopez as the new assistant principal of Captain Walter E. Clark Middle School. Next, I'd like to welcome Raquel Ferreria as the new assistant principal at Options High School. I'd also like to welcome Elizabeth Huerta as the new assistant principal of Sunridge Middle School. I'd like to welcome Ileana Castillo as the new assistant principal of Sunridge Middle School. I'd also like to welcome Elizabeth Salceda, Salcedo as the new assistant principal of Desert Wind Pre-K-8 School. And finally, I'd like to welcome Elizabeth Marquez as the new assistant principal of Purple Heart Elementary. We had so many great new leaders, there wasn't even room in the front row. I apologize for that, Ms. Marquez. Our team recently had the opportunity to tour Eastlake Middle School, which is being built to serve the growing Eastlake area of our district. I am pleased to report that the school is looking great and the project is on schedule for completion with ample time for the new team to move in and prepare to welcome students for the 2023-24 school year. We have two special recognitions on the agenda this evening. I'd like to personally say thank you to the law enforcement officers here tonight for their partnership and support to keep our students and staff safe. We are honored to have several representatives from the agencies that responded to and assisted in the recent lockdown at Socorro High School. Working alongside our Socorro ISD police services, these officers and their teams proved to be invaluable partners during that critical time as they helped us work to keep students and staff safe. Thank you. Also, we will be recognizing employees who retired from the district in recent years. Congratulations to these incredible, valued members of Team SISD. To these employees and their families who supported them during their careers, thank you for the hard work and commitment that contributed to the success of countless students, our schools, and the district overall. Congratulations and thank you to the SISD retirees. Also, we have had several ribbon-cutting ceremonies in celebration of our new turf fields at El Dorado High School, Americas, Socorro, and tomorrow we will have a ceremony at Montwood High School at 3 p.m. Our golf tournament committee has been working hard to raise money for the SISD Foundation Excellence in Education for Student Scholarships, and I am very happy to announce that we anticipate breaking a record and surpassing any amount raised in previous years. I am proud of our team efforts for the, for the sake of our students' futures. We would like to invite our schools and district community to wear pink on September 30th in support of KVIA ABC7 and their partners in their cancer awareness efforts. And lastly, just a few short announcements. We have our 2022 Socorro ISD Employee Art Show Contest tomorrow evening here in the DSC starting at 4.30 p.m. And on Saturday, September 24th, we have our 11th annual Father-Son Conference from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. and it will be held at Montwood High School. This concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. 
We will now move on to item number four, special presentations. Mr. Daniel Escobar. Good evening, President Mena, members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Carmen. My name is Daniel Escobar, Chief Communications Officer for the school district, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's recognitions. If you all will please step down to receive our honorees. Our first special presentation, as mentioned by Dr. Carmen, will recognize the law enforcement agencies who partnered with, with SISD Police Services to ensure the safety of students and staff during a recent emergency at Socorro High School. SISD is grateful for the prompt actions and collaboration from the many agencies that responded and assisted during the lockdown. Their partnership and support are greatly appreciated. Some representatives of different agencies were not able to join us today. However, we would like to extend our thanks to all of the local, state, and federal agencies for their assistance. With us today are, from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, Corey Harrison. Also from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, Samuel Magallanes. From the Texas Department of Public Safety, Jaime Aburto. Oscar Luna. John Valenzuela. Eduardo Morales. Victor Anchondo. Miguel Acosta, <laughs> representing the Socorro Police Department, Jessel Diaz, <laughs> from El Paso County Constable Precinct 1, Oscar Ugarte, <laughs> Texas Parks and Wildlife, Freeman Cones, Also with the Texas Parks and Wildlife, Autumn Gillespie. From the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Special Agent in Charge, Jeffrey Downey. From El Paso County Constable, Precinct 1, Francisco Almada. From the Tigua, Tigua Tribal Police Department, Gerardo Velasco. <laughs> and El Paso County Constable, Javier Garcia. If you wouldn't mind, all please returning to the front for a photo with our trustees and superintendent. Let me do a second row. Can you see everybody? Okay. 
Thank you all so much for your partnership and support. Next, we recognize and introduce extraordinary group of educators who have devoted many years of service to Team SISD. They are the employees who have retired from Socorro ISD during the school years of 2020-2021 and 2021-2022. The retiring employees will receive a personalized photo collage to commemorate their time in the district and a lifetime activity pass, which grants them access to all district sporting events. These outstanding individuals have dedicated many years to serve SISD students in schools. They educated countless children, leading them to great success and guiding them on a path of endless opportunities in our school district. We thank them for their longtime commitment to education and for their service in Team SISD. We wish each one of them a happy and healthy, well-earned retirement. We'll begin with Rebecca Alejo, Secretary from Ernesto Serna School. Next is Lucy Avalos, a bilingual teacher from Sergeant Jose F. Carrasco. Hortensia Baca, teacher from Luján Chavez Elementary. Avelia Bachman, school nurse from Escontrias Early Childhood. Maria Delia Brito, Crossing Guard Cafeteria Monitor from O'Shea Callagher Elementary. <laughs> Guadalupe Calvillo de Portillo, Child Nutrition Services Worker from O'Shea Callagher Elementary. <laughs> Yvette Carrion, Diagnostician from the Special Education Department. Francisca Castaño de Gonzalez, a monitor at Sun Ridge Middle School. Rosa Esser Cornejo, crossing guard cafeteria monitor from America's High School. <laughs> Chef David Dean, culinary arts teacher from America's High School. Rebecca Faudoa, custodian from El Dorado High School. <laughs> Patricia Fuller, school nurse from Keys Academy, Escontrias Early Childhood, and Escontrias Elementary. <laughs> Jose Galindo, bus driver from our great transportation team. Francisca Garcia, cafeteria worker with CNS. Corina Gomez, a teacher from Horizon Heights Elementary. Virginia Gonzalez, special education teacher from John Drugan School. Susan Hernandez, a secretary from Socorro Early College High School. Tomas Hernandez, a security officer in our district. Maria Hoover, kinder kindergarten teacher at Jane A. Hamburg School. Maria Inguianzo, teacher from Bill Seibert School. Victoria Laca, a school nurse from Socorro High School. Right, Araceli Lara, 
special education teacher from Elfida P. Chavez. Maria Lara, excuse me, Secretary from Human Resources. <laughs> Elena Ledesma, bus driver from Transportation. <laughs> Laura Lujan, teacher from Specialist Rafael Hernando III Middle School. Estela Mejia, nurse from Waco Elementary and Health Services. <laughs> Elvia Mendoza, teacher from Elfida P. Chavez Elementary. <laughs> Olga Mercedes, monitor and cross guard from Loma Verde Elementary. Margaret D.W. Morgan, social studies teacher from Captain Walter E. Clark Middle School. <laughs> Hilda Ortega, assistant principal clerk from Socorro High School. <laughs> Olga Pagan, special education teacher. Maria Prieto, bus driver from Transportation. Ron Quiet from the Special Education Team at Purple Heart. Blas, Blas Amarez Rivera, teacher from Dr. Sue A. Shook Elementary School. George Rodela, social studies teacher from America's High School. Rosa Rodela, monitor and cross guard from Waco Elementary and Socorro High School. Margarita Ryan, a math teacher from Socorro High School. Corrine Solaria, teaching assistant from Fine Arts from Montwood Middle School. <laughs> Carlos Sandoval, assistant principal from America's High School and director of the Trailblazers Early College. <laughs> Araceli Silva, police and peace officer from Police Services. Sergio Silva, Sergeant from Police Services. Yeah. Phyllis Soli, Assistant Principal from Purple Heart Elementary. Yeah. Esther Trujillo, Teacher from Sierra Vista Elementary. Mary Ann Trujillo, bus monitor from Transportation. <laughs> Elma Valdez, cafeteria monitor from Montwood High School. <laughs> Robert Valles, bus driver from Transportation. <laughs> Michael Vasquez from Police Services. And last but certainly not least, Leticia Zapien, a foreign language teacher from Socorro High School.
congratulations once again for all of our retirees that we value tremendously. If we can have you all back to the front, we're going to take one large happy group photo. So if you can all make your way back up to the front, and as they're gathering them for the photo, uh, just want to mention that all of the photos taken by our district photographer, Mr. Largo, are posted on our district website. There's a camera icon on the bottom right-hand corner of the website. It takes you to our Smug Mug, Smug Mug account. <laughs> and all of these photos are there, uh, will be posted there for free high-resolution download. A little tongue twister. Thank you, though. Do we need to move this? All right, if you'll hold up, all, all of you hold up your frames. If we'll have everybody smile, if it, just everybody look. Don't look at your family. Just look at Acavius right here in the center, please. Keep smiling, keep smiling, keep smiling. All right, go. one more, one more, one more. All right, thank you all so much. Again, congratulations. Yes, thank you. 
No, there's no fans. Yeah, be careful going through. Yeah, my car. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Be careful. All right, bye. See y'all later. Make sure you have it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know until I was reading the script. <laughs> I was like, when, when did that happen? That does conclude our recognitions for the evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think Daniel should total up the years of experience there. About this X number of years. Yes, we'll, we'll swim by rule. Okay, we're moving on right along. Look, looks like we cleared out the, the boardroom, but <laughs> if you guys were willing to move a little bit further up front, we don't bite. <laughs> okay, here we go. Board of Trustees, new business. A, consider approval of the National School Lunch Week of October 2017 to 21 to 2022. Presenter, Ms. Shinoski, how are you? Good, sir, thank you. Thank you, President Mena, Dr. Carmen, Superintendent of Schools, and members of the board. My name is Shelly Chinoski, and I'm the Director of Child Nutrition Services, and I have some of my amazing leaders here tonight. 
Please stand up. Woo, there you go, do the wave. All right. So each year the nation celebrates school lunch week. This celebration honors the school lunch program and the many students that it serves throughout the country. Here in Socorro, from the first day of school to today, we have served 923,862 healthy, tasty lunch meals at our campuses. CNS strives for excellence in our 45 cafeterias with trained employees who prepare meals on each site. Food safety is top priority in our kitchens. We serve high quality meals that are healthy, nutritious, meet all USDA guidelines and are appealing and delicious too. The meals we serve are geared towards fueling our scholars to achieve academic success throughout their day and throughout the school year. With that, I am honored to introduce to you one of our very own Team SISD fifth grade scholars who will read the National School Lunch Week proclamation. She is from our newest Escontria STEAM Academy, which is providing hands-on engaging learning experiences in science and the arts. Please help me welcome student Jasmine Pasillas. Whereas the National School Lunch Program has served our nation admirably for 75 years through advanced practices and nutrition education, and whereas the National School Lunch Program is dedicated to the health and academic achievement of our nation's children, and whereas recent research shows students are receiving their healthiest meals at school, and there is evidence of continued need for nutrition education and awareness of the value of school nutrition programs. Now therefore, I, Jasmine Pasillas of the Escontria STEAM Academy of Socorro Independent School District do hereby proclaim the week of October 10-14, 2022 as National School Lunch Week. And I encourage all residents to become aware of the benefits of the National School Lunch Program and support good nutrition habits for their children in hope of achieving a more healthful citizenry for today and the future. Administration recommends approval of the proclamation. Motion to approve. Second. Second. So I have a motion by Mr. Morales and a second by Mr. Barrera. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. All right, congratulations. Okay, moving right along to open forum. Where's my sheet here? The district is a local government body charged with serving the educational needs of all school children in our district. And the board meetings must be focused on meeting this charge. The district board meetings are public meetings under the Texas Open Meetings Act to conduct the business of the district. They are not, however, meetings of the public. Therefore, all persons in attendance are expected to display civility and decorum. Individuals shall refrain from using harmful and offensive content, i.e. libel, slander, defamation, obscenities, or fighting words for the respect and rights and the reputations of others. We greatly appreciate those individuals who have requested to speak to the board during open forum in, or in regards to a specific agenda item. We are bound by certain time constraints in order to cover all items on the agenda, therefore must be limited to five minutes. Please respect the rights of others in your presentations. By law, the board cannot take action upon or discuss any item which is not posted on tonight's agenda, but we will give all presentations our serious considerations. Thank you. Let's proceed to open forum. And at this time, our first speaker, uh, Serika Barlow.
Give me an S. S. Give me an I. I. Give me an S. S. Give me a D. 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 What does that spell? S-I-S-D. Now that I've gotten your attention, my name is Sarika Barlow. I am the interim CEO for the YWCA Paso del Norte. And we are here to invite you to walk them out 2022. We're going to paint the town red. As you can see by our motto here, Sean, if you could demonstrate. Walk a mile, we'll be, we will be donating all of our proceeds to walk a mile to the Sarah night. <laughs> All of the donations to the Walk a Mile will go to the Sarah McKnight Transition Living Center. That is a center for battered and abused women. And we are here to ensure that they have an opportunity to not only live in dignity, but live in safety. So every dollar that we raise in Socorro Independent School District, you have done a phenomenal job over the years supporting this cause. You are second to none in your donations. So the YWCA is here not only to motivate, but to encourage you to come out for this wonderful cause and to continue to do above and beyond what you've done. Forget what you gave us last year. Give us more this year. <laughs> yeah. So October the 27th, Southwest Stadium. There will be a plethora of teams and men walking a mile in the shoes of our battered and beaten and harmed and injured not only moms but kids that have had to suffer and see that abuse. So we want you to come out and support us, support the cause, and most importantly, give these women and children an opportunity to live a life in dignity. So come out and walk a mile. And, and there's a little schnooze there with the gifts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, on our next speaker is Mr. Tommy Hill. Okay. I wish it wasn't as, was as pleasant as the last one. Okay, when we did the compensation package, we talked about years of service. Now, um, you know, that still hasn't been done. We're almost the intercession. Um, I've had every excuse in the world. There's been no updates through HR. It still hasn't been done. 90% of our monitors making the same wage 20 years or less, all making the same wage. Um, about 10 monitors making over that minimum part of monitors. That should be fixed. I've had every excuse in the world. That should be fixed. They tell me that HR needs to fix our years of experience. You know, I got a friend. She's had to turn in her years of experience, and she's only been here for nine years, four different times. The same paper. Where is it going? Why does everybody have to keep on turning in the same paper? That's not right. Now, if it's different papers, that's a different story. But it's the same stuff each and every time. Now, if it's different, that's a different subject. And then, if you don't know what you're doing, HR wants the original, but they want you to turn it in every single time. So what do you gotta do? You gotta go get that original three, four, five different times. That needs to be fixed. The accounting through our experience with HR needs to be fixed. Long time coming. This needs to be addressed. Now I understand that there's a graph. There's a graph for uh, years of experience for bus drivers. That, 
still not being addressed. There is a beginning wage, a medium, and a high point for our mechanics and our monitors. But you know what the, the excuse I get? That we don't have a wage scale. Second grade math. I could do that wage scale in two minutes. It's second grade math. How does that take seven weeks? <clears throat> this needs to be addressed. Now, I've been putting people off. I've been putting people off. I get these calls left and right. When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Now everybody thinks I'm lying to you. You know why? Because HR is not doing what they're supposed to do, not doing what they said they were going to do. We need to get our experience. Our experience needs to be taken care of. Please, this needs to be done. Let's move on. Let's get it done. Get her done. It needs to be done. It's not that hard. Now, here's what I've been told. HR only has five people. They can't get it done. I don't know. Then, superintendent, you're supposed to sign off on it. That's what I've been told. And then it's got to come to the board. Well, I know it's not going to happen because there's no agenda for us. There's for other things in compensation, but not for us. This needs to be taken care of. We need to, before I came here, they treated transportation like a redheaded stepchild. That doesn't happen no more. Let's not go back down that road. Let's fix this. Please, we're begging you just to get what we deserve. And this was told to us through compensation and we're still waiting. Please, let's get on it. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Crystal Salido. Hi, sorry about that. My name is Crystal Salcido. Thank you for allowing me to speak, President, Superintendent, and Board members. I have been a school, high school English teacher for 10 years, and over four years ago, I experienced my first active lockdown. In that moment, I knew I would do anything I could to make sure that my students made it home. But I also knew that my desire to do so wouldn't necessarily dictate that outcome. I began sketching and prototyping devices until I came up with SLAN, which is formerly DoorJam, a device um, teachers that uh, can use for their classrooms. As a teacher myself, I know that oftentimes, especially right now, we're asked to cover other classrooms, substitutes are in classrooms, situations happen where testing is going on, and we may not end up in the classroom that is our own, where we have keys. This device, which I'll show you in a minute, um, is meant to be able to allow teachers to safely secure their rooms without opening the classroom door and potentially exposing themselves and their kids to danger. These are quick and easy to install. The lock or latch can be engaged with one hand and removed quickly for law enforcement. I know teachers, in my experience, are going online and trying to find their own solutions all across this country to protect their classrooms. But I believe that having a uniform tool that is approved by the district is the safest route for schools. I want school districts to know that there is Slon Safety, this device, which they can offer their teachers that can be a step in showing that they understand their fears and the fears of their students and are willing to help ease those with this action. I would appreciate if you take that into consideration and I'm gonna quickly demonstrate for you how it works. So here is a demonstration door that I made. And in the corner, in between the bottom and the top, Handle. Halfway in between, these two squares are mounted, and then uh, up your podium here. 
then all you do is you simply slide out this latch, which is held in a storage pot that is bright yellow and can be put in a common area in all of the classrooms to safely keep it away from students and so that teachers have access to it no matter which classroom they go into. If there's a situation, they remove it from that area and they simply slide it in. Sorry, I can't see. And it doesn't allow the door to be opened without them having to go outside of their door to lock it. Works for left-handed doors, right-handed doors, outward double doors, and they come in three iterations, one for doors with handles on the right hand side, one for handles on the left side, and then a flat iteration for double doors or doors that open inwards. So here it is. I have some pamphlets and literature that I would like to pass, if that would be okay with you all. Yes, you may. Thank you. I don't know how much time I have, but... Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Mr. Sammy Carrejo. Wow, murmurs already coming. Greetings, guys. Everybody, I know you guys are shocked to see me here. Um, <laughs> I had a gentleman in the back say that he, I remind him of Mr. Thompson. I don't know who's been here long enough, but something about a gentleman who would always come in here and read from the Bible. I promise you I won't read from the Bible, but... I will be like Mr. Thompson and keep coming here. Uh, my goal is to uh, talk myself out of a job, really. Um, I know you guys get tired of hearing me over and over and over. My goal is to do this to the point where everybody knows what is going on. Uh, I am not an educator, but does that not mean I'm not a teacher? Everything that I have in his big head isn't going to do me any good if I don't share with everybody else. So as you guys know, I am the moderator of a group called SISD. Watchdogs, if you guys are on Facebook, only 75% of Americans are, so chances are you might be, go take a look at it. Whether you agree with me or not, it's always nice to take a look at it. Okay, that way you can take a look at what's going on. What we specialize in, in that group, is transparency. Now, I'm a numbers guy. Where are my finance guys? Raise your hands, raise your hands. Yeah, no one's gonna raise their hand because they don't wanna agree with me right now. But anyway. There you go, numbers guy, health guy actually, <laughs> healthcare in the finance area. So you have to understand numbers to understand what's going on. Because a lot of times you can have the numbers in front of you, but if you don't know how to read them, it doesn't matter. My biggest issue is transparency or lack of. When I grew up in the projects, when you go to the projects and you see a cholo or, or a uh, person doesn't look too good, you're ready, prepared to maybe get robbed, correct? When you walk into a building like this, you don't expect that, right? But the problem is, with lack of transparency, we're dealing with a different type of thief. We're dealing with people who are taking our tax money. And that tax money that they're using for their own benefit is taking away from our retirees. We just saw that. It's taking from our teachers. And most importantly, it's taking from our kids. When you think of corruption, you think of an evil man. Most of the time it's men. I don't know why, but everybody thinks it's men. I don't think so. But anyway, you think of an evil man with a mustache and, and, and laughing all the time. But in fact, corruption is not done by the mean people. A lot of time we are fooled by those with a smile on their face. Those who give us this and give us that. Like they say, don't bite the hand that feeds you. So for too long here at... SISD, we've been talking about corruption. Everybody says, we all know they're corrupt. They're all corrupt. Who? All of them. Can't do that. 
It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Fortunately, like I've said before, this isn't my first rodeo. I've been involved in a lot of investigations, as you guys can tell, with some of the stuff that I've produced. Um, I always like to tell people that I really don't do anything for a living, but I do. Uh, but that's not important who I am. The important thing is what we've been finding. I'm a little upset because of what happened prior to. We did have an auditor. Um, she's no longer here, no offense to her. I'm not even a college graduate. I only went to high school three years, in fact. Graduated early, but still. Um, but yet, I could read through those financials, and I am finding a whole lot of things there, and I'm not liking it. And I'm not here to make friends. I know there's a lot of people who are upset, but you know what? I'm not worried about making friends. I'm married. My wife says I'm not allowed to have friends, you know? So all I want to say is we have produced some information to the board. The board knows. I'm not really here to talk to the board. I'm here to talk to everybody and to those cameras. It's nice to know that when I walk into places, people recognize me. It's kind of scary. The gentleman in the corner, he says, what are you going to talk about now? And, you know, I'm not doing this for fame or glory. I'm doing it for my two little brats who go to SISD. And you should be doing it for your little brats as well, for your kids who are at home who look up to you, who trust you to do what's best for them. And so just for those who don't follow their group, we are following the money. We are following donations to board members. Now, when I find something, somebody says, well, they're going to go to prison. No, those things are not punishable. Sometimes the worst thing they can do is just an ethics complaint, and it's a $3,000 fine. But what I'm trying to do is show a trend, a trend of where money's coming, who gave it to them. Now, a lot of times, they don't give it straight from a company. They'll give it from a relatives. I can research all that. So that's what we're doing right now. And unfortunately, not all the board is here. I wish they were. But as you can imagine, just like I'm making enemies, I'm feeling some of the retaliation. The day after I released financial campaign contributions, my vehicle was stolen. That's OK. I'm a private investigator. I found it within two hours. If anybody knows Kevin Wiles, Tell them I'm coming after them because that's who stole it. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Sylvia Torres. Good afternoon. Hello, President Mena, board members, and Dr. Carmen. My name is Sylvia Torres. I'm a medical assistant. Um, and on behalf of Nurses Aides, which are made up of certified medical assistants, Nurses Aides, we're requesting fairness in salary. Um, many probably identify us as just the Nurses Aide, but we're more than a just. We have criteria we have to meet to maintain our certification. We pay our yearly dues. We have to pay to maintain our continuing education credits, uh, which entails updates on conditions, illnesses, up-to-date lab tests, um, advances made in treatments. We maintain our CPR. Um, we comply with the district as far as having to have trainings to allow us to help the nurses with screenings for vision, hearing, assessments, spinal, acanthosis. Um, the district nurse has confidence and trust in us to allow us to have worked in schools that have no nurses. Um, this is for weeks at a time. Um, we're supposed to sub at different schools days at a time, many times working outside our scope of practice, which means diabetics, emergencies that come around, um, assessments. Nurses have to meet many deadlines for multiple reports, which leaves us as the aides managing the uh, office, which was a large flow of students, a lot of times teachers, employees, um, they come in. It's much more than just handing a glass of water to them and an ice pack. Thankfully, we, um, we've worked alongside with the doctor, whether it be general or specialty practices, and we come to the office. We come to our employment with medical experience, and we work with the nurses, and we actually learn from each other. Um, it's a very bitter, bitter pill to swallow, knowing that our own manager thinks we're only worth only $2 more when we have to go sub at a different school. So it leaves the question, will this mean we're not going to get paid again until the end of the school year? 
um, category, there's another category of paraprofessionals that are getting paid a higher salary than we are, which don't have to meet any criteria of certifications. Um, uh, they work with our scholars. Um, they don't have to be monitored or shuffled around to different schools. We all enjoy and value the work we do. That's why we have complied with the demands and reporting to various campuses. Most of the time, it's on a last minute basis and a request. Our question is, how do you justify nurses' aides in a low salary category? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number seven, district reports. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. T, how are you? It, great, sir. How are you? Good evening, President Mena, members of the board, and Dr. Carmen. Um, I'm here tonight to um, provide um, a district report and information item, which is our mandatory update um, to our up updates to um, our return to in-person instruction plan. The reason why we have to do this periodically is because if we have accepted ESSER 3 money, which we have, right, we're in year two of um, doing that, we have to periodically revise our instruction plan to um, show where we are in terms of our um, response and how um, that looks. When we remember, and, I'm, and I won't go, there certainly aren't good memories for anyone about this, so I won't take time on that, but we did have a different one that you all remember that was from the darker times, and it was quite detailed, quite large, um, lots of things to it. What this is, is a revision of that, and it's thankfully much more pared down with where we are in the present day and age and time. Okay? So we are looking, we are here with a second consecutive year back to um, in-person instruction, and we're buoyed by the efforts that we've made in responding to the pandemic to include um, academic, social, emotional, and um, safety protocols the safety protocols that took a long time to develop are now very routine in, in nature, and we still continue with um, CDC and City County Health Department guidance in order to um, make sure that we are um, doing the proper things that we need to there. We made um, lots of academic gains after the um, end of the 1920-1920 school year and throughout the 2021 school year. Those were dark times. We made lots of gains um, last year, and we had... Um, we're trying to continue to get that op optimal educational experience for our students. And the goal is after we came much further in that one year, we are continuing to try to exceed the pre-pandemic levels that we were at. And just like Ms. Borrego always says, we're getting an A. Okay? So we're, work we're working very hard towards that. Okay? So in academic support, we're continuing to provide high dosages of tutoring, um, whether it be in the extra time or whether it be during in-class intervention. And the accelerated learning also, we're trying to get back, not that we weren't before, but now that we have that hard data again, we're trying to make sure that we continue to get back to um, looking at, to see where our meets and masters level are as well as our approaches. Looks like we've got quite a lot of people that are passing now, so we've got to continue to work towards those um, higher levels, as we always do. Um, so we've funded lots of more district-wide initiatives in terms of academics. There's a list of some of those there. We've got these district-wide now, um, district-funded. Um, it's um, These are in elementary, secondary schools. Um, they've We've really come along with a lot of um, initiatives in order to continue to close gaps. As far as technology, during the peak in 2021, I think all of you remember when we went from like 20,000 devices to like 60,000 devices overnight. Remember the traffic jam out on Rojas where we were, where everybody was coming to pick up their laptop and that sort of thing? Well, even though everybody's been back in school for the second year now, we've still got all that going. So what we, um, what we want to make sure that we're always doing is to continue to integrate um, technology properly within the classroom and use it as a tool to continue to accelerate instruction. If someone is COVID-19 positive and must be at home, we still have the Schoology platform 
for teacher communication, assistance, um, access to content, notes, and assignments. Okay. Social emotional is also a big thing with ESSER. There's a list of um, things that we have for students that we are continuing to use, and we had some of these last year, and some of these um, we are starting this year. Um, these are some new, some of these new programs and some of the old ones too, but some of the new ones are particularly outstanding and we expect to see excellent um, results out of those. We also, staff member, um, staff member social emotional um, well-being is also important. Uh, we have um, some of our initiatives up there, the healthy body, sound mind. Um, I think I need to find a way to get to that, but I just um, have not seemed to um, find a way to do so. Okay? But, um, I don't know, one of these days I'll impress my boss and I'll do it. Okay, there's, um, so we have a lot of things. We're looking at a rapid mental health referral service platform. You all um, had a resolution for EPSL that we're taking care of. Capturing Kids Hearts also has a staff component. Health and safety, um, we're still with, a, we're looking at HVAC repairs that we're looking at, um, best practices, uh, CDC guidance. Um, hallway, meal times, transportation, recess. Um, we're still trying to make sure. It's kind of like when they say, don't call pass interference all the time. Okay, like in other words, let them play. Okay, we're letting them play. But, we've got to, but we have these things where it's a routine now. It's more consistent in terms of safety um, practices. Okay. For example, we always use this still. We're in the green zone. Uh, we've been in that for a while, and that's a good thing. Uh, we have been in the red zone and the orange zone and the yellow zone before. So it does get stricter if there have, has been more transmission in the area. We're continuing to be at, operate at no limitations right now. Okay. This one on the right, um, the Keep SISD Safe, that used to be like seven or eight slides by itself in the, in the original, seven or eight slides for each, each component there. Now we've kind of got it down to one. You know, those are our proactive health and wellness protocols. Face masks are optional. We've got a couple where we say strongly recommended certain situations. The e-swipe has been more simplified. Uh, there was a time when we had a higher rate of transmission that there were like seven or eight um, different choices um, on there. It's kind of come, it's come down a little bit where we're, not, where we're still documenting, of course, but we're checking more on the positive side. For employees, of course, if you're suspected, it's still if you're sick, stay home. Hallway transitions, um, trans transitions, one thing that is notable here that we updated is that we had the A-B block schedule in 2021, 2022 in grades six through 12, and we've gone back to traditional eight periods. Okay. Recess, again, letting them play, but sanitizing, hand washing, um, all the routines are in place. Mealtime best practices, um, letting them eat, what, do what they wanna do. We're not really doing all of the far distancing anymore, all the staggering, but at the same time still making sure that those protocols are in place and that people don't share things. I don't believe they should do that anyway, but especially not now. Okay. Um, transportation, we want to make sure that there's circulation, that we're using the sprayers, that we can social distance when possible. It's a little bit tougher on the crowded routes, like out in the, the big suburbs that are really upon us but we do the best that we can with the sanitizer, circulation, sprayers, other types of things like that. But we try to stay with the district capacity and social distance when possible. Volunteers and visitors, it used to be much stricter in the harder times, but now we just have the hall pass wellness questionnaire at the front and volunteers, visitors just aren't recommended to go and check out a school or do something if they're not feeling well, but it's simplified compared to the tougher times. So um, that is all that um, I have to say on that. Again, this is just a required update um, as part of accepting ESSER three funds, but the um, good um, part of this is that um, we have responded, we have responded well and we have gotten further and um, it's much more simplified and this will, we're gonna go ahead and um, post this up as an update. Thank you, Mr. Starkey. Yes, sir. Any questions from the board? No? Thank you. Okay, this time we're going to do the uh, facilities report. Mr. David Carrasco. Good evening.
Good evening, Dr. Um, President Mena, Dr. Carmen, and members of the board. Good to see everybody again. My name is David Carrasco, uh, Director of Mesa Operations for Team SISD. Uh, real quickly, to give you an uh, update on the facilities, we'll start off with uh, Socorro High School. And with Socorro High School, uh, moving quite well uh, at this time, uh, the, again, Pointing out, I know I use a pointer all the time and you can't see it, but the orange peach colored section is phase two. And at this time, uh, what we have going on, uh, we've mobilized our custodial team and they're in there getting all the, uh, the floors polished, waxed, and getting prepared. At that same uh, time, uh, we're receiving uh, furniture, office administration furniture as well. And uh, I'll be coordinating with uh, Dr. Astorga to uh, make sure we can coordinate and move in everything, hopefully to have everything uh, moving forward by the end of the October intercession. So that's our, that's our plan at this particular time. I know our custodial team is doing a great job because I, I got a call yesterday and they were saying, hey, you know, the construction team is coming back in after we get these floors all uh, waxed and polished. And, uh, you know, they're getting kind of a little upset. So I told them, hey, don't worry, we'll take care of it. But they're coming back in and getting everything prepared for you as far as, as, far as that, that phase. Uh, as far as pictures, I, I know we had the, uh, in, uh, Early August, we had the, the, the walkthrough, uh, the tour, and from that time, uh, this day, from that time is, is much, much progress. Uh, and going back to the first floor, where they say the main gym, the, the pit, uh, of course, there's some, uh, they're doing some a total re, uh, I guess a re, refacing of that, so that's, that's progressing as well. But uh, if you go by, you see that fence is still in the front. Once that fence gets removed in the administration area, you'll see that it's starting to take a lot of shape and, and the inside has, has made a much, much progress. So moving forward with, with Secor High School, I have a few pictures. Uh, and really the pictures don't do it justice, but you have the administration uh, area, the entrance, uh, quite a grand entrance coming in. Then you have the, the reception area, uh, some of the areas there, some classrooms. Uh, this one, I think, believe is part of the, uh, <clears throat> the science labs. And like I said, from, from, the, from the tour, uh, just a great facility. Uh, and then we have um, the uh, TV studio. So just a very, very beautiful facility for, for the students once they get taken in there as for Secor High School. Uh, any questions on Secor High School Mr. at Manning. this time? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Potter. So right now, three questions. Yes, when are we, you said towards the end of the intercession, we're scheduled to open possibly the, the remainder of the school? Because I saw... I think it was a blue part that was might look like it's going to be open a little bit later. Yes, yes, yes sir. That purple bluish area, correct, yes. Mr. Bedetta. That's going to be the uh, the weight room, uh, the auxiliary gym. But if you remember from the walkthrough, it, it's right there. It's just finishing up the the flooring, uh, some of the the up on the top as far as the the, the uh, scoreboard, and then there's a little additional work that's going to be taking place. But well, again, we'll continue to coordinate with the with the contractor and have that ready as soon as we possibly can. That orange section is where we're, we're making sure it's taken care of, it's getting the, uh, the, uh, the furniture moved in, set up, and we're, like I said, working during that intercession time, getting those classrooms take, filled in and, and, uh, and ready for, for use. Okay, and then when I was at the homecoming, I got approached quite a bit, and they showed me pictures of already of the new, or the classrooms that have already been open for a little over a year already. They're pretty much falling apart, honestly. Like you have the molding at the bottom that's already falling apart. You know, we've had some elevator. There's been a lot of issues that, you know, administration parents and even students have brought to my attention. So I don't know if it's the contractor that's not using the good material, but I mean, it's a brand new school. It's barely even a year open and we're, you know, a lot of these things are falling apart. I, I know our custodial is doing, but it's more of the, the construction company yes, that sir. doesn't seem like they're Yes, putting good quality material into yes sir very good question buildings. and i think i think it was exactly what you, you were talking about there uh we're working we're uh, working with the construction team getting back with the, with the contractor trying to make those little uh repairs you know when you move into a new house there's always some little things that take place but we're going to coordinate with them make sure that everything is put in place correctly and then we're getting the, the best product we possibly can but i think i know what you're talking about yes sir i think my concern is just that it's repetitive and compared to the other schools that were getting redone or, you know, added on and stuff like that, it doesn't seem like it's that problematic in those other campuses. It just seems like Socorro's getting hit really hard with that aspect of it. Yes, sir. And I will coordinate that with the construction team and we'll make sure we bring those those concerns that you're mentioning to the to BTC, the construction 
Thank you. Yes, sir. Any, Any other questions? Yeah. No. Okay. Moving moving forward is the uh, SAC two, SAC two complex. That one is uh, also uh, right now. If you go by there. A lot of plumbing and electrical, a lot of plumbing, a lot of plumbing, a lot of groundwork, uh, doing uh, numerous inspections. Those inspections have been going really well, working with our contractor, Baines Construction. They've been uh, coordinating with us, and, and hopefully that's moving really well. Um, that's, of course, that's the, the final rendition. Uh, let me see if this picture, if I can explain to you a little bit, they give you a better idea. But uh, the picture on your, on your right, if you look at uh, on your right-hand side, that'll be end up being the... Uh, the uh, Home bleachers, of course, right in the middle, right in the center piece would be the, uh, the field. The, your far left will be the visiting bleachers. And then the north part of the photo or the picture will be where the uh, administrative uh, fine arts facility building will be. So it's start, I know it doesn't seem like, but it's just starting to take some shape and, and they're doing, they're doing some, some progress there. Um, some of those concrete panels are the ones that they lay them in the ground and they lift them up, put them in place, so they'll start taking some more shape. 30 days, when I came earlier, about 30 days from you, know, of course, in construction, especially with all the rain's been taking place, uh, you don't see a whole lot. But there is going by there on, on as much as I possibly can. You'll see there's, there's some, some good movement going, going on at this time. Okay? And then, again, just a lot of, like I said right there, it says the, the CM footings, once they do those, those concrete uh, uh, panels and they put them in place, and then that, that left-hand photo is what I would mentioned earlier, numerous, uh, numerous amounts of, of plumbing and electrical that's is getting set in place. Yes. Any questions on the, that part, on the SAT 2? Okay. Very good. The, the last part I have for you is the East Lake Combo School. Again, we had a, uh, a very nice walkthrough. I wish I, should, I had that date in my mind just a second ago. But anyway, that went really was very successful. I think uh, we appreciate all the board members that were there and everybody that was present, our, our staff and administrative staff that was present. We appreciate that. Once you go in there and you get a sense of it and they take you the walkthrough, uh, it gives you like a better picture of how, how, how things are taking place. Beautiful color schemes, uh, you know, uh, and just a really n beautiful building. So uh, I'm pretty sure once it is finalized, coordinating with everybody, we'll get another... Uh, Another walkthrough and tour. You can see all the final product. Some quick. Uh, here's a good picture there. The gym, uh, beautiful floor. The color, like I said, the color schemes really, really caught my eye. Uh, here's some areas there. And then, any questions on the combo school? Okay, thank you. And the last picture is when I wanted to. Uh, I know Dr. Carr mentioned it a little bit earlier in his in his piece, but. Uh, uh, all the fields are finalized. El Dorado High School, it's on there, but uh, then we have uh, Socor High School, America's High School, and like I said, they mentioned, yes, tomorrow will be at 3 o'clock, a uh, ribbon cutting for Montwood High School. So I'll make sure I'll be there. Go Rams, and uh, any questions on that? Anything? No? Again, thank you, Chair, to the board, and, and for uh, that's really been a great addition for the, for the students. When I do go out there, they're, I mean, just happy. Like I said, last time I mentioned they're out there doing, uh, I guess you don't call them snow angels, but they do these turf angels, I guess, and they're having a great time. But thank you all. Any questions on that? All right. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you, David. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Was that it? it? Yes, sir. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Our next agenda, number eight, consent agenda. Mr. Mena, yes. if I can pull item 8M. 8M? Yes. Anything else? Yes. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Was that it, Cindy? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 8F7D. 8F7B. D. David. Oh, D. 7D, okay. Yeah. Uh, 8K. And which one's that? K. King, 8K. 8K, you said? Yes, and you pulled M, right? 8K. Or just K? Just letter K. Just K? It's the whole. Okay, I got 8F, 7D, 8M, and K. Anything else? You got M, right? No, I did not get N. 8M? 8N. M, Mary. Yes. 
Oh, you didn't. Okay, yes. Anything else? Okay, at this time. Question. Yes, go ahead. Mr. Castellano, for clarity, it's the uh, Dell Financial Services Security, security camera Cameras. service refresh, please. Okay, just wanted to be sure we got the right yes. one. Okay. Motion to approve excluded the items listed. Second. second. Okay, so I got a motion by Mr. Naja, a second by Mr. Morales. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, first in the agenda is 8F. No, let's go with 7. F7D. Yeah, let's, S let's go. FD. Let's go with 7D. 7D. There's not a 7D. It's 8F7D. Okay. Sorry, Who's going to talk about 7D? Texas Director of Contracts, Bill Financial Services. Go ahead. Good evening. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, in the uh, Financial Committee, we, I asked you how many days of uh, recording space we were gonna have, and you mentioned 20 to 30 days, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, what is the retention period required for security cameras? I wanna make sure we have enough space saved. Good evening, members of the board, um, President Mena, Dr. Carmen. So the, the average, the days, the number of days that we retain video for is dependent on the number of cameras mm -hmm. that are deployed throughout the site. But the retention period required by law for to uh, hold security footage before its deletion, what is that for the district? For the district, sir, I, um, I'm not aware of a district guideline as far as the number of days that are required for storage. Can definitely look into that and ensure that we're compliant. I know that um, we strive to have 30 days of archive data. Mm -hmm. However, it, again, as I mentioned, depending on the number of cameras that have been deployed, the, number, the amount of days can vary. But I can most definitely look into that, look into policy, and see if there is something in place with a retention period. sure that we period. beat our retention period on that, that we're not deleting data prior to its retention meeting met? Absolutely, yes, sir. Excuse me. I would like to consult with our attorney. Do, do you have any information on that, Bob? Can you hear me? This is the first time I'm trying this. So, uh, Actually, no, I don't know off the top of my head that retention period. But I know that this is a contract, so uh, the contract's gonna definitely state that whatever is required by law, they're going to comply with that, obviously. Well, let's verify that before we move forward on it. Okay. We, we can verify that the contract ensures that they're gonna comply with all the laws that are required on the keeping of these uh, videotapes. If I may um, just add, the actual lease is for the hardware, which is going to be storing um, the data within it. Now, this is part of a replacement cycle, so it's a refresh for our existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, if we can find, if we find that the retention period has a required number of days, then we can make the necessary adjustments to probably move some cameras onto another secondary server to help ensure that we're meeting that and, and compliant with the um, archive schedule or the, the requirement, retention requirement. Okay, when can I get that information? I will research it, sir, and we can get that to you as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Moving on to 8F. 8K. 8K. Mr. President, do you, do you want to consider for approval the item that we just spoke on, or do you want to... Or you can also consider a one motion for all the items that are pulled, but it's in the bo board's uh, discretion whether they want to take it one at a time. Well, it, this next one also is going to, because it, it, on 8K2, body-worn cameras too, it's going to also 
lap over is then now the retention period definitely for body cams is going to be a lot longer and we're going to need a lot of server space for that so uh is that considered with this grant or is it going to be something else Do we need more time to research this? Should we table this? Or? Mr. Ramirez, is this something that we can just approve now? And if it's over the $100,000 threshold, then we can bring it back to the board for any additional servers that need to be applied for that? It goes over 100. Yeah, if, you're, if you're talking about item K, are you talking about item K With or the previous item? Well, you're talking yes for the K. So can we just go ahead and approve this? And if we need to add an additional server for the retention, because this is only adjustments uh, contractual. Correct? Yeah, are they, are they related? Are we going to use the same server space? Do you have server space allowed? Yeah, I, I that's don't what know I'm that. trying to figure out. Are we going to get enough space for it? Good evening, sir. If I may um, address that question, Lieutenant Johnson and I have had a conversation regarding the grant, and we know that incorporated into the grant application is the server that will house and retain the data for the body cameras. Good evening, members of the, the board, President Mena, Dr. Carmen. The grant that we solicited was through the, um, the governor's office. And it is all inclusive. It does it, uh, We did request 54 cameras, servers, um, the equipment to translate the, the video, and we're in the process right now of finishing up our, our policy on retention periods as far as the, the videos go. So the retention policies for videos that we will have that we need for cases, either felony, misdemeanors, um, or any other traffic stops, will have a definite uh, time frame that we will retain them. By law, we do have to meet that, and we will at that time. Yeah, it just didn't say anything in the grant that servers, they'll give you the cameras for free and sell you all yes, the server sir. time in the world. No, and That's where the money's made in these things. But Yes, sir, this is uh, through the, the governor's office. And I'm, okay, I, yeah, I just want to interrupt. make sure that we're getting the servers and they're not going to hit us. Off. No, sir, this, it is an all-inclusive um, process, so it will include the servers, the servers that we will have. So we'll have our, the, the sole right to our videos. We're not going to have to pay Axion or one of the other companies to go ahead and house our, our cloud or anything. Our okay. videos. If we do that, yes, every one of these companies that do sell video cameras sell the video cameras very low, but the server space is what they, they get you on afterwards for the retention period. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Um, we can approve the, the Dell service one. I, I, the Dell that. Uh, but we have to get the information back on, on that to make sure we do. And so, so which one do you want to table? Let us know. You don't want to table? I think the, he's saying neither one of them. So approve all I of don't them? think we need to. We can, we can, still we can make adjustments. It. We could approve it, and then, but we need to get the information back right away before any other. Because it, it, if it's a long retention period, if you're looking 90 days or whatever, it's going to really eat up uh, space. And we got to make sure we have that in place. And the same thing with uh, the body cams because they two-year retention, three-year, five, it, it adds up real quick and eats up your space and just want to make sure we don't lose any video. No, sir, we won't. Uh, yeah. The On the plan, we will figure out a way of either having a hard drive version of it or having a video disc or however it is that we have to do, but the videos will be retained. The way we presently have it right now with the, the, the department, we do retain cases until they're, they're, they're finished off and then for any appeals afterwards. We don't yeah. destroy any videos at this point, even from the school district, until we get clarification from the uh, from the district attorney's office or the county attorney's office where we could destroy evidence we don't do that at all so we have cases from the from the beginning of the of the district's police services we still have videos that we're still holding yeah, on i just to want right to make now. sure we don't it will eat up the space quick i was it happened to me back when i was on the department it yes, eats sir. up your space quick so we have to make sure we we can anticipate that and that we yes sir and, and, and we don't fall the biggest thing is on that i'm, I'm i couldn't tell you because I have, I've never been hands-on. The part of the training is included with on how to use the system, and I'm pretty sure that we could take the videos and we can incorporate them into a different format or a different file format. We might be able to use 
the uh, the CDRs and be able to record on there. I'm, I couldn't tell you because I haven't had any experience with it, so it would be a moot point to try to explain it to you know even to myself because I couldn't okay. I couldn't tell you, sir. Okay. Yeah, just keep us informed too. Also, if you you know you need more space because that's going to be expected. Yes, sir. Thank we'll you. Expect that. But uh, we can approve them, and then we just need the information back if it's going to exceed. Okay. What motion to approve 8F7D. Second. So I got a motion by Mr. Nakera and a second by Mr. Barrera. All those in, mo all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve 8K. Second. I got a motion by Mr. Nakera and a second by Mr. Castellano. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Did we do 8M? Yes, sir. Not yet. Clear bag policy. Who's going to talk on that one? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Mr. Calderon. Good evening. I just wanted to pull this for clarification. Sure. At the top of the agenda item, it says clear bag requirement for fans at the student athletics complex and possibly high school campuses for athletic events. So... <laughs> Is it one or the other, or is it both? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, uh, President Mena. Dr. Carmen, members of the board, JJ Calderon, Director of Athletics. Uh, I think we initially proposed it. We wanted to take a look at um, implementing it at the SAC first, um, seeing how that process goes, uh, and then introduce it to the campuses at high school gyms first. Um, that's, that's kind of how we wanted to roll it out. Okay. And, and so parents are going to be notified yes. of when it's going to be. So after, if, if, there, if this is approved, uh, the next step would be to start working on signage and getting the word out to our community so that we're not catching anybody by surprise and um, people are prepared when they go to games to, to have the bags um, and we're not turning people away because they, they, don't, they don't have the right clear bag. Uh, so we would uh, have a a time frame where we would uh, definitely try and get the word out to our community so that, again, we don't catch anybody by surprise. And when do you anticipate this being into, in effect? Um, I think it would be about two weeks once we get signage by the time we put it up. Um, maybe that's the last part of our football season for the SAC, and then we'll see how that goes. Uh, talk to our administration at our high schools and see how we can roll out a plan at our high schools to implement that in our gyms. Mr. Castellano? Thank you. Oh, uh, yes. Will you do Yes, sir. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead Mr. Castan. Okay. Um, it says policy, but it wasn't presented at the policy committee. Do you have the policy with you? Um, I think it was more of a guideline, sir. Uh, I guess we used the word policy. We did uh, present at CNI. Well, your excellence um, approves something that's in the air right now. If you can just bring it down in writing, we can approve it. Because what are the bag sizes? What is required? When you know? Right. Are they going to search purses, small purses? Um, what size? I, I think, what's exempt? I don't know. Sure. So you, we need we need that information. Uh, I think we did submit. Did we not it's, submit the the, um, the flyer to? Is it not in the board packet? Page two eighty five. Look for it. Didn't see it. And this is what we would base our signage off of, sir. I apologize for not having that for you. Um, tell, told 270. But I think this was, yes. It's on page 270, sir. Thank you. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve. Second. So I got a motion by Ms. Nahira and a second by Mr. Morales. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And okay, moving into new business. Item 9A. Discussion and possible action regarding redistricting criteria and public engagement strategies. Initial maps, plan one. 
Andrea Cruz. Good evening, President Mena, members of the board, Dr. Carmen. Uh, we are presenting tonight um, information on redistricting. Again, just as a reiteration, it's a process by which the boundaries of elective districts are periodically redrawn in response to changes in population. Um, tonight, we have a presentation by Ashley White from Thomas and Horton LLP and Rocky Gardner from Zonda Education Templeton Demographics. They'll be sharing a presentation of the initial maps uh, provided for the board's consideration. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as Dr. Cruz said, we're going to be talking about the initial maps. So these maps were presented to you all a couple of meetings ago um, during the June board meeting, I believe. Um, but and that was when Rocky was per, was discussing the change analysis. Um, we're going to focus solely today on these maps. Um, this is uh, the base plan. Um, and this is what we're going to build off of, assuming that um, there are um, changes that the, the board wants to make to these maps. Um, and so um, Rocky is the star of the show this evening. So he's going to be the one that's primarily presenting um, as a demographer. Um, I'm going to jump in at the very end just to kind of remind us of where we are in the timeline. But I'm going to turn it over to Rocky now. Thank you, Ashley. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, great. It's a pleasure to be back in Socorro, even virtually. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go through the change analysis pretty quick because you guys have seen these slides. Then, then I'm going to jump into to the first plan. But I, th I think the change is, is important because we need to understand why we, we made some of the moves that, that we made as a team at, at Zonda. So this, this is your current single mem member districts as they looked using 2010 census block. So keep in mind, we had, we, this is all built off census block data. And so 2010 was the previous, and this is why we're going through this 10 years later. So in 2010, the district had 179,659 persons. The largest single member district was district four with 36,600. And the smallest was district five with 34,500 just a 6% differential. So re really clean, about 36,000 average. So that was a really clean set of boundaries that we made there in 2010. Fast forward 10 years, we per the first thing we did was recreate these boundaries using 2020 census blocks. We had to use the 2020 census blocks. If we zoomed in, there's sometimes little slivers that you can't see because the 2010 census blocks didn't line up the same way as 2020. But for the most part, we were able to create almost the, the exact same boundary. But of course, like everywhere else, there, there was growth in Socorro's. Socorro's ISD population in 2020, based on these census blocks, was 242,000. So now we're averaging 48,000 per district. What we saw was we saw districts two and district four grew significantly, almost doubled to 67,000 and 62,000 respectively. And your smallest district became District 1 at just 33,351. That's a 103.9% differential, more than double, less than half the largest uh, district. And, you know, in, in, in retrospect to, to that, you see District 1 actually declined in population from 2010 to 2020. District 2, district two growing by over 31,000 and District 4 by 25,000. So, I think initially when we look at our plans, what we need, need to understand is we've added over 62,358 persons um, from 2010 to 2020. So again, 242,000, a differential of 103%, slightly higher than that 10% that we need to be, be within. The most populous single member district now is, is went from four to two, and the least populous district went from five to one. So redistricting was required. So this is where we left off the last time we were all together. So any, any questions before I jump into a plan? Here we go. Plan one. So what, what you're seeing here is the plan without the current di district boundaries on it. Remembering what we had to do was we had to make, you know, we had to make two districts significantly smaller, and then we had to make three districts quite a bit larger. So the, the, the best way to do that for us, and what you're seeing here is now a blue outline, which represents your 
your original district boundaries and the colors. These colors represent the new or the proposed plan, the proposed base map. So where you see color, and I think you guys can see my, my cursor, bleeding through a blue line, that means we've we've moved that district line up. So you can see we're five, we, add, we need to add population to five, we moved five north, we need to pull population out of four, and, we, and so you can see where we moved population from four to two. Now the best way to do this, because we knew that four was so big, we basically worked our way from the south to the north. So we, we knew we had to drop population out of four. We, we, we didn't really try to take it out of five because we had to add population to five as well. So we, and we had to bring population down from two. So we, we pulled some population from, from two into four. We moved some population to five north into one then of course we had to add even more to one so you can see where we moved one up into three and then we moved one over and took some population that was in two two was a kind of an upside down l there and and then of course three had to move into what was previously part of two and previously part of two because th these two polygons are both a little bit of a gap right there that but three has these these two corners here so with that we were able to get down to within 6%, pretty similar to where we were at 2010. Again, the average being 48,000. Your largest district with 50,000 is District 2 in this plan. Your smallest district is now District 5 at 47,000. We feel like we had a, we, we got a really clean differential. These next couple of slides, you know, just talk a little bit about these changes. The total population of District 1, 47,880. This is kind of over and under the ideal size. So this is kind of how close they were to, to the average. D District two being about 1800 over, District five being about 900 lower. But in, in the end, the over and under was really pretty tight with that total, total deviation of 5.7. I'm gonna jump into a couple of these and you know, just to show you where we made changes, it's really, you know, it's all right here. All of the changes can be seen on this one map. So. This is a this is just an area of change. You, you can see where where District Three went down and grabbed some two District One. So District Two we had to bring the most out of. So that's why you see the most the most change happening in District Two. What I've done is I've just got a map of now of each individual district. So District One, keep in mind this was District One here that we're now expanding up into District Two. This change represented going from 35,000 to 33,000 in the current, again, a decline. And then of course we added, we added population putting it at 47,880. Now I, I'm not going to do a lot of detail about your breakdown of populations because you're, you're majority Hispanic. And, and so there, there, there's no significant impacts there. Just um, understanding voting age population, that's the population that's 18 and over. And citizen voting age population, again, would be the share of that voting age population um, that are persons that are citizens. These two, the voting age, the green and the blue areas were all part of the census block data that we looked at. The orange area was an extrapolation using block groups and American Community Survey. And single member di district two, this is the one, remember, we had to make quite a bit, we had to make quite a bit smaller. So that's where they lost a lot of population here in one and three and of course they went down and they they also grabbed some population of four because again we had to move from the south to the north and their analysis here they stayed pretty flat third i mean from where they started at 67,988 to 50,261 we we still they're still the largest district but but we pulled out over 17 or right at 17,000 persons District three, you can see here in two spots, we have the, the long area up here where Fort Bliss is. And then of course, this corner here and this area here that was formerly district two. And when, when we're done, I've got software. If we need to zoom in tight to any of these areas, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do that as well. District three analysis going from 39,000 to 48,000. Again, staying right at, that, right at that average that we're trying to hit. District four, still wraps around district five just, just like it did in 2010 we just pulled some population out of district four and moved it into two to kind of create the the domino effect that, that we we needed again 62,000 dropping down to 48,000 
And finally, District 5. District 5, the bottom looks very, very similar to how it looked before. We just had to move, we just had to add some population up here to the north to get District 5 back up into the close, close to that average number that we were looking at, going from 38,700 to 47,400. That was pretty quick. Before we go to the timeline, I thought we might want to, if, if you want to jump out and look at anything or answer any, any questions, that's my job. Hearing none, might not hear any questions. No questions. Ashley? Okay, so um, just a reminder of kind of where we are in the timeline. Um, this is, um, we're at September 2022, that board meeting in which Rocky is, has presented the initial maps. And so now we are looking for feedback from both the board um, and from the community. Um, offline, since our last board meeting, um, we've partnered with, um, with your great staff and they've done a great job in helping us get a website up and running or a web page up and running that's uh, dedicated to the redistricting for 2022. And so that went live um, last week. Um, so you can access that and you can access all of our past presentations as well as um, the, the, the proposed maps for plan one. Um, and so we are working on uh, finalizing a survey um, which we will uh, go make live as well on the website, which will allow the community to provide their feedback. And so that's really the, the goal right now uh, between the months of September and November is to get feedback from the community and from the board um, so that um, we can determine, because right now we have a map that's in compliance. As far as um, it bringing it into that 10% differential, Rocky and, and Matthew and, his, and their team have done a great job in, in doing that. So they've gotten that job done. However, um, we also have to take into consideration all that other criteria that should be considered when it comes to adopting a final map. And so um, if there is an issue with uh, maybe we've split up, split up a neighborhood, uh, maybe we've split up a community of interest, those are things that we we're looking for feedback from now at this point. And so between the months of September and November, we're looking to get that feedback. That way, Rocky and Matthew can go back and draft alternative maps if necessary. Um, and, and hopefully by, by November, by the November board meeting or sometime within November, we can have a public hearing um, in which we will present those maps and allow the public to come and provide their feedback on those maps. And then by December, we will hopefully have a final map that will be going before the board for adoption. So that's where we are on the timeline. We're doing really great uh, with keeping in line with everything. And, and now we're, we're done with our presentation. So we'll just open the floor back up for any questions from you all now that you guys have an understanding of where we're at in the timeline. I'm sorry, Ashley, can I add one more thing? Sure. Um, I just wanted to say too, I have had some conversations with uh, you know with a di some district team members that uh, Juan Jaime in, in, in particular shared me some areas like Ashley mentioned that we're that we might want to tweak a little bit to to, to, get, to get some cohesiveness and some neighbors. So we are already looking at some of that. We we just can't really make those changes without we want the board to see the initial plan before we make any um, proposed plan changes. I just wanted to say that pub publicly. Juan's pro probably there wondering. Want to make that clear. Thank you. Any questions from the board? No? Okay. Do we need action at this do time? We, do you need an action at this time? Is the agenda, they, they, it says action, possible agenda, discussion, and action. You don't need action at this time, right? So no, we're not looking for action at this time. We're just looking for um, feedback um, either at this board meeting or um, if the board wants to uh, contact us offline. Um, individual trustees um, can certainly, um, you know, through the through the designated contact person, um, reach out to us if they they have any questions about um, this initial map. Okay, so at this time there won't be any action taken. We'll move forward. Thank you, Ashley and Rocky. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, consider approval, item 9B, consider approval of revision of local policies. 
Dr. Andrea Cruz. Members of the board and Dr. Carmen, uh, administration is recommending consideration and approval of revisions to the following policies as presented. Uh, the first policy is DC local. Um, we are modifying, revising employment of contractual personnel to read the board retains final authority for employment of all administrative positions. The board delegates to the superintendent final authority for new employment of all other contractual personnel. We're supposed to change the wording in that? And that, that was modified, sir, but it's not based on the recommendations. The board retains final authority for employment of all administrative positions and the board delegates to the superintendent final authority for new employment of all other contractual personnel, meaning teachers. It was supposed to be where he approves the new contracts and that we retain the annual. Okay, we can, we can very well add that. That was discussed at the policy committee. Okay. I'm happy to revise that and bring, ba bring that back or if you're okay with me Revise it uh, revising it and moving forward. We will add that it is for new hires and annual renewals will be brought to the board. We have FDA local. We are removing verbiage regarding tuition. Tuition is no longer uh, required in the district. FDB local, intra-district transfers, we're updating the language from, uh, updating the number of categories to 14 and including the elementary academies as reasons for intra-district transfers. And then GKC local, we are modifying elect, actually adding, excuse me, adding elected officials. Any elected official visiting a campus must notify the superintendent prior to the visit the superintendent will notify the board and we've included the verbiage from GKA local regarding campaigning. Campaigning shall, shall be permitted only on general election days in areas designated by the district and in accordance with applicable law. No campaigning shall be permitted on campus or district facilities on any other day. That concludes the revisions to the policies. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Motion to approve excluding Item DC, pending the revision is noted. Second. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Najera and a second by Mr. Barrera doing the exclusion of DCE, right? DC. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item agenda C. Consider approval of the financial advisor services. Good evening, President Mena, members of the board, and Dr. Carmen. In July, we went out for an RFQ, RFP, excuse me, for financial services. And we had four in individual companies that did respond. Of those four, three of them, we've narrowed it down. And tonight, we do have two of them that we'll be presenting to you. We've asked that they keep their presentation to 10 minutes with five minutes question and answer for any other questions you may have. And at this time, I'd like to invite Estrada Hinojosa to the podium. Good evening, Mr. Minna. Board of Trustees, Dr. Carmen, pleasure to, to see you all tonight. For the record, my name is Rudy Mejia with Estrada Hinojosa and my colleagues are handing out the presentations uh, that we'll go over briefly. I'll give her a second to, to do that. And I believe um, the presentation may be on, is, is it on, the, on this? Oh, look at that. All right. Um, so again, thank you all for your time tonight. We're, we're very excited to present our credentials to you. Uh, first and foremost, we're big believers of team, right? In order for us to best provide our service to school districts, we believe in a team concept. And so I'd like to spend some time talking about who we have here behind me. Uh, to my immediate right is Mary Inahosa Kelly. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. 
uh, absolute um, best teammate I could have ever asked for. Her and I have been partners for quite some time, and she has been my right-hand woman for, for many years. And uh, she represents some of the largest school districts in the state. Immediately behind me, this uh, handsome fella is uh, Devin Phillips, and head of our trading desk. Um, she, he is out of Dallas, Texas, and I've had the pleasure of knowing, knowing Devin for many years now, and he is very highly regarded as an industry expert, uh, very well known, very well regarded, and we're so happy to have him on our team. And I'll get to why it's important to have a, a, a Devin Phillips on the team and how it benefits the school district in a bit. And then lastly, to my left, we have Angel Magallanes. Um, he will be serving as a support banker on, on the account, very well versed in school education, school finance, a former board member himself out of the Valley, and just an absolute resource that we have on our team. Oh, and, and lastly, my name is Rudy Mejia, like I mentioned. I'm proud to say that I am from El Paso. I actually grew up in Socorro ISD. My parents' house was right off of uh, 3617 Colville Drive, or right down the street. Right. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I didn't go to Socorro ISD. I attended Clint Independent School District. My mother was a teacher there at the time. Uh, but she did wrap up her career uh, here in Socorro about five or six years ago. She uh, worked at Options High School. Uh, her name was Yolanda Mejia, and uh, we're so proud of being here. Uh, on top of that, I, I do want to mention that our firm recently opened an El Paso office. We, we do represent one independent school district here uh, in Canotillo ISD, and so we're committed to the area. We're committed to serving the community, and we're so proud to, to say that now we have an El Paso office. It's located off of, off of Mesa in Montana. But our, our firm's been around for 30 years, and um, we have accomplished so much in this 30 years. As a minority-owned firm, a hub-type firm, we have the privilege of representing all sorts of issuers across the state. In fact, across the United States, for that matter. Uh, we were the financial advisors to the Dallas Cowboys when they uh, built the Cowboy Stadium, now known as the AT&T Center. Uh, we represent issuers, uh, San Antonio Water System, CPS Energy, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, um, many, many different types of credits throughout the state. However, independent school districts happens to be our specialty, and the team that you see here today represents quite a large amount of, of school districts in, in the state. And here's how we rank up uh, amongst other firms uh, throughout the nation. Currently, we're the number five financial advisor in the nation uh, based on the number of bonds that we bring to market. Of this number, right now we're currently sitting at about 5.8 billion. Of that number, it's roughly about 1.2 to 2 billion of that is school district bonds. And so I'll sh the, the graphs on the bottom right kind of show our growth over the past 20 years in all the states that we do business in. But Texas is our bread and butter. We understand Texas credits. We understand what impacts um, you know, school districts in particular. I am located in Austin. However, I'm charged with building out our El Paso office. I'll be the managing director of the office. And so here's a, a quick snapshot, snapshot of some of the school districts that we represent across the state. One in particular that I think um, is similar to Socorro Independent School District is Pflugerville ISD. If you look at the size of that district, it's about 45,000 students. I know uh, Socorro is roughly around 47,000. You know, similar, um, similar happenings over the past five or so years with rapid growth. Um, you know, houses are going up. You know, I, I remember growing up here, East Lake was just all desert. Now it's Amazon, houses, you know, Walmart off of Horizon Boulevard. It's, it's fascinating to see. I wish there was a Peter Piper uh, there when I grew up here. But, um, you know, we specialize in fast growth districts. The team that you have here, we do represent the Fort Worth, the Austin ISDs, the Dallas Independent School Districts. And we're very honored to serve these districts. And we understand what is needed to prepare a district for what you all are about to go through with the continuing growth. And I think it's important to understand that we play a, a really integral part in the overall mission and goals of the school districts. Um, you know, it's my personal belief that the role of a financial advisor has changed. 
we're no longer just present on game day when the district wants to go sell bonds, right? We are with you guys in Vicky's right-hand pocket and Dr. Carmen's right-hand pocket. We want to be a resource to the board. We want to understand exactly what is impacting the community so that we could best serve you all. Uh, you know, your constituents are the taxpayers. Our main job is to ensure that you have a cost to borrow that's as low as possible. Keep that interest rate as low as possible, pay off the debt as quickly as possible, and finance you know, your buildings in a, in a, mo a most efficient manner. So we believe that our team is positioned, we're capable, and we believe that we're the best fit uh, to, to, to serve the district. You know, I understand uh, we're, we're, you're interviewing the, the Royal Bank of Canada after, after us, and that's fine. I think it's important that you talk to and weigh every provider against each other, right? Competition produces um, some significant uh, um, products for you all. But I want to end real quick and, and bring Mr. Devin Phillips up here because I, I believe his value, his, his uh, expertise will separate us and, 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 um, and I think you guys will find that very, very beneficial. Uh, Devin, you mind, you mind coming up? Thanks for the opportunity, folks. Um, you know, there's several different ways to look at this, but I believe that an underwriting desk, trading desk, and which I've been dealing with myself for, you know, 30, 38 years, uh, ran the region for Citigroup, ran the region for UBS, and went to work with Estrada Hinojosa about a year and a half ago. And we built out our desk uh, to handle quite a bit now. But I think one of the most important things is I know you don't deal with a lot of bond transactions. It's usually an annual thing or, or every other year thing. Um, but I believe that what we strive to do with our outfit is get you the best execution that the market's going to allow you to get. Um, and we pride ourselves on that. We're involved in the secondary trading every day. We're in touch with the top, you know, 200 clients that usually buy bond issues on a daily basis. We bid competitive across the country. We're involved in negotiated deals, not only underwriter, but also municipal advisor. So the information flow into us is uh, extremely large. It gives us a lot of insight as to what the buy side's doing uh, to get a better execution, whether it's couponing, call strategies, whatever it might be to help you folks save a dollar. And I know every basis point counts. I live in this state too, and I've helped numerous districts over the years I've been doing this save basis points that do add up into real money over time. So we take it personal. I can tell you that the team that I work with and the team that's been assembled here uh, on a daily basis, we're engaged in quite a few transactions. We have a lot of information that can help you folks. I work hand in hand with the bank side uh, and, we, and we construct the best possible structure that works for you and your taxpayers. Uh, you know, with, with that being said, best execution is what we strive for. And I can assure you that you've got a room full of 10 people in there that'll make sure that happens. So consider us. We look forward to working with you folks if we can possibly do that. We have a lot of happy, happy clients with us right now. And uh, we look forward to being of service. Thank you. Right on time. Thank Lastly, perfect. I want Socorro ISD to be the premier district in El Paso. I think you're, 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 you're set up for that. I think you're ready. And if you're looking for a financial advisor to take you to that next level, to bring you on par or, or competitive with other school districts in the state, we're, we're that team for you all. Let's, let's take Socorro ISD to the next level. I'm ready to answer any questions. I think we're out of time, though, but is there any questions? You got five minutes. Of you questions. got five minutes for questions? Five minutes okay. for questions. I think that's what it's set up. Any questions <coughs> from the board? Thank you so much. Thank you.
we have one more presenter from RBC. If you could please come up, sir. And we have um, handouts as well as the electronic copy. Would you would you care for the for the hard copies yes. as well? Great. Can we just drive it? It's really yes. wonderful. Good evening, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Dusty Trailer. I'm a managing director with RBC Capital Markets. With me this evening is Rafael Martinez. Uh, he's a vice president with our firm. Uh, both of us are out of our firm's San Antonio, Texas office. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to present with you this evening. Uh, we would be delighted uh, to be considered to be the financial advisor to Socorro ISD. Uh, we have, we've given you a presentation that's got entirely more pages than we intend to go through this evening. Um, so just bear with us. Um, just want to quickly kind of go through a couple, of, a couple of items as it relates to just kind of the overarching who is RBC Capital Markets uh, at first, and so if you'll turn with me into the presentation, and we'll also pull it up onto the screen, is just our overall team. Our team assigned to the district is comprised of myself, Rafael Martinez, uh, as well as Steve Fortenberry, Clay Malden. That's our primary banking team assigned to, assigned to the district. But then we've also got other folks, both nationally and regionally, that provide us with expertise and oversight. Uh, I will also point out to you guys down at the uh, in the box that sh that that says municipal underwriting, Chad Runnels. Chad Runnels is our lead Texas bond underwriter. Anytime we are the financial advisor to a district, we believe it is our duty to help be called upon uh, to help offer our clients guidance in the bond pricing process. Chad is our lead Texas underwriter and underwrites uh, probably more Texas K-12 issues than just about anybody out there. And so we'll lean heavily on his expertise as well when it comes time to bring your transactions to market. I've been with RBC Capital Markets for going on 22 years. This is the only firm I've ever worked with. Uh, Rafael here has been with our firm for 15 years. You kind of could say we're homegrown. There's, there's a lot of folks in our industry that have <clears throat> been with various different firms, moved around here and there. Uh, Raphael and I are not the only two at our firm this way. There are many in our platform that have been here for years and years. We believe that that speaks to the stability uh, of our firm. Our practice in the San Antonio office is heavily uh, geared towards Texas K-12 financial advisory work. This is the bread and butter of what we do. We represent clients uh, all across the state of Texas. We represent clients uh, from all different geographies in the, in the state, from the southern tip of Texas to the near northern tip of Texas, all the way east and, and west as well. Um, and and those, those clients range in all kinds of different demographics and all kinds of different wealth metrics. We think that's key to us providing Socorro ISD with outstanding service. RBC Capital Markets, uh, began its practice in Texas in 1933. We have been providing 
municipal advisory work and investment banking work for Texas municipalities since that time. Um, we have over 400 employees throughout 16 offices here in the state of Texas. Um, our firm is also unique in the fact that we're not simply an advisory shop. We also have an, un I mentioned, we had an, have an advisory shop. Between FA and underwriting, we participate in almost one third of all Texas transactions. That's a level of experience that we believe helps us to educate or execute better for our clients by being almost like, it's a poor sports analogy, but I'm gonna use it, almost like a baseball player, the, the times at bat. A baseball player has those times at bat and may know better what's coming because of their level of experience. Um, we believe that helps our clients. On the next page, page 10, we look at just who is RBC nationally. RBC nationally uh, is one of the largest investment banks uh, in North America. If you look at the graph at the bottom right, uh, our bond ratings of our firm are one of the highest bond ratings of all firms that are in the municipal finance space. We believe that that means that when the going gets tough, we've got the financial backing to stand behind you. If something were to ever go wrong, uh, we've got that, that, financial back, that financial backing. And we've got resources, not simply here in Texas, but also nationally. Moving over to, to page number three, I think it's important for us to look not simply at who we are as a firm, but who we are in Texas K-12 finance. So that's what we've done here in Section 3, is designed Section 3 to talk specifically about K-12 finance. Going back to 2017, basically the past five and a half years, we have served as financial advisor on over 149 separate Texas K-12 financings, totaling more than $8 billion. Also during that time, we've been a senior underwriter on 318 transactions for Texas K-12 totaling just under $25 billion. Um, to the right, we kind of give some tombstones of the firms that, of the districts that we represent here in the state of Texas. Uh, again, you can kind of see that geographic uh, disbursement. You can also see the size disbursement. Uh, advisor at Dallas ISD, advisor at Fort Worth ISD, uh, but then you see uh, growing Hayes CISD, Austin ISD, Waco ISD, uh, in the lower Rio Grande Valley, Far San Juan Alamo ISD, San Benito CISD. And we provide on the next page, page number 13, just a, a kind of a smattering of tombstones of, of transactions where we've been financial advisor. We use this term in our industry, tombstones, all the time. It's a bad use of words. I don't think anybody passed away over the course of doing these transactions. But again, represents our recent transactions uh, with Texas K-12 issuers. Uh, you, you see there uh, 264 million at Dallas ISD, 115 million at Hayes CISD, 189 million at Waco, uh, <coughs> but then you see Palmer ISD, uh, 2.2 million dollars. So uh, issue sizes all over the place. Slide number 14, I think really gets to, to the heart of, of something that I am uh, very, very excited about, uh, and I think it really speaks to how we go about conducting our business with our clients. Um, going back to May 2017, what you see listed here are not simply the bond elections uh, that have been successful for our firm. These are bond elections of, for which this team before you uh, has been part of the financial advisory team and led uh, for Texas school districts. We've been part of 23 separate successful elections going back to 2017, totaling over $5.579 billion in approved uh, referendums by Texas voters for Texas school districts. The thing that I will, I will go on to point out is if, if we were to just slice our list, our experience list from May 2020 through the present, our team has had a basically near 100% success rate. Our clients have passed nearly 100% of their school district bond elections during that time. And then on, on page 15, 
we, we just simply list out, again, a number of our clients uh, across the state in alphabetical order for whom we serve as, as financial advisor. Section four is a bunch of pages. I'm not gonna go into it. Section four includes our scope of services. We view our scope of services all encompassing, meaning we wanna be with you from the ground floor up, from the time that you guys start really looking at a bond program, helping you with the election process, ultimately the success of that election, and then throughout the sale. We want, we've designed our scope of services such that your team, when they get ready to, bless you, uh, your team, when they, when they get ready to execute with us, they're not hesitant, they don't need to be hesitant to pick up the phone and call us and ask us for advice. We wanna always be available and always be ready for, to, to offer that assistance. And our fee schedule is such that there's not some annual retainer or hourly billing. We only get paid at the time that you guys finance and close uh, a bond transaction. So no one has to worry that, oh man, if we pick up the phone and call Dusty and Raphael at RBC, the clock start, starts running, they're gonna start billing us. That's not how this works for us. Uh, in, in conclusion, I, I, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, um, this is a people business. And that's, that's one of the things that we enjoy most about our, about our business here, working with school districts across the state. We want to see our clients succeed. Um, our success is not our success. Our success is your success. And we wanna see you have that. Um, you know, we've got all the qualifications in the world, all the experience in the world. One of the things though that I think that stands out for us um, is, is, is our team. <clears throat> Our team is familiar with your team, your senior leadership team. We have worked closely together and uh, were successful in passing bond elections in, in a location and in a time when passage of the bond election uh, was, was highly unlikely. Um, and that's one of the things that, that uh, we take a lot of pride in and success in and delighted to be part of that. Be happy to answer any questions that, that y'all have. Any questions? Do you have any clients in El Paso? What, what, what? We, we, we do a lot of underwriting work out here. Uh, the city of El Paso, El Paso ISD, it's led to ISD. We've underwritten for, for all of those folks. But, it, but in the county specifically, we, we don't have um, a specific financial advisory client. I can't, I can't sit here and tell you that we do. No, but, but again, we've got, we've got a lot of clients across the state very similar to Socorro ISD. Any other questions? Question. Go ahead, Mr. Nair. During your presentation, when you were showing your logo page there, um, actually, it was a little before that, you mentioned uh, the chat significant financial backing in case things go wrong. What could go wrong? Whenever, whenever, whenever you're doing a, a bond transaction, there, and in a, in a district like Socorro ISD, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of transa of, of, at stake there. I do not foresee that anything would go wrong, right? Um, however, that's not to say that it's impossible that certain things would go wrong, whether it be malpractice, what have you. Um, it's, it's within the realm of possibility that certain things could, could go wrong. Our malpractice would be on you all, not us, right? That's correct, sir. Oh. I don't, like I said, it's not happened in my 22 years. I'm just trying to figure out why that's important. Yeah, it, it, I'll tell you another, th another reason that it's important. When we, when we get ready, this is probably more important than the other. When we get ready to go out into the market to sell Socorro ISD bonds, the bond market nationally knows the scope and breadth of our firm. And they know the fact that we're, we may be working with Socorro ISD today. Well, tomorrow we're leading a transaction for Dallas ISD or, or somewhere in Florida or wherever else. And those investors need to know that we're not gonna give away your bonds. And if they expect us to give away your bonds, they're not gonna work with us as we work with other clients as well. We're gonna hold their feet to the fire to help you get a better deal because of our, because of our breadth and scope. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. We know you have a lot to consider.
Yes, we Have do. Have a great evening. Thank you. So in your packets, you do have a scoring sheet. If you choose to score these yourself, we have met Dr. Carmen and myself and Mr. Reina and two other accountants. We did meet, we, we did, um, did the score sheet, ranked them ourselves. We are completely open to any questions or any recommendations that you might have. Any, anything y'all want to discuss? Mr. Minna? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mena, uh, in the past, the board has never chosen the financial advisor. Uh, it was left to those who had more knowledge and experience in finance. Uh, I would like to hear whether uh, Ms. Pettis or Dr. Carmen has a recommendation for them to make the recommendation versus the board, because it is not the board's responsibility. And, and, and I agree with you, Ms. Nakeda, because of the fact that we are not accountants, we are not in the financial business. That expertise goes to, to you and to you. So you, you're gonna have to recommend, at least in my opinion, in your opinion, I don't know about the rest of the board's opinion, your recommendation has to come to us. Not a problem, so, sir. So, Dr. so first of all, I would say any of the three firms that we selected as finalists could handle the uh, the bond work that we're, we're anticipating for Socorro ISD. They're all high quality firms, um, but if you want the recommendation from, from administration, from our committee that we pulled together, um, Estrada, Hinojosa, and company scored slightly higher than the other two. So it would be the recommendation from our committee. Okay. I believe, I believe the idea was that we would look at them and maybe if we had questions or we possibly had uh, maybe some input as to what we feel, but I think uh, Personally, I think the, the uh, financial uh, folks that we have, including our superintendent, uh, have made the recommendation that I think will fit our need. So with that said, do I have a recommendation? Do motion I have a motion? To approve. Motion to approve. Second. Oh, I was just well, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Motion the to three, approve three what? Three of you all reviewed the... It was myself, Dr. Carmen, Mr. Reina, and two other professional individuals from the it business office. It was unanimous? Office. No, it wasn't actually, it wasn't unanimous. We all had a different opinion. We all come from different backgrounds, which is the great thing about scoring them with different personnel. Um, but for the most part, when we add up the scores all up together, Estrada Hinojosa did come up just slightly higher. And Dr. Carmen is correct. They, they would all do very well. And they were very close. Curious. Okay. The so, to get, it was that. I was mean, just curious to, to get everybody, all the input. Okay. Thank you. So, so I have. I'm a, sorry. I'll I'll make ahead, a motion to approve Estrada Hinosa as our financial advisor services. And I'll second. So I have a motion by Ms. Najera and a and a second by Mr. Morales. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to item number D, consider approval of the health plan design recommendations for 2023 plan year. Good evening, board president, Mena, Dr. Carmen, members of the board, Mario Carmona, director of employee benefits and risk management. Um, this is the information that was shared early with the group during our workshop session. And um, we will not go necessarily through every single slide in detail as we were, but if there's any questions as we go through the information, please feel free to let us know. And I'll let uh, Mr. Randy do the driving. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chairman Mena, members, uh, members of the board, Dr. Carmen. I'm Randy McGraw with Hub International. <clears throat> and I'm prepared to continue to answer any other questions that you might have as we um, go through the presentation we saw during the uh, board workshop as well. <clears throat> so again, there were three components of the presentation. Talk about the transition and the need to make some decisions to be prepared for open enrollment. 
talk about the proposed benefits and then proposed payroll deduction amounts as well. <clears throat> so again, as a result of the RFP process, it does appear that uh, there'll be enough savings that are generated through the selection of Aetna uh, to stop the district from having to continue to tr uh, infuse funds from the general fund into the health plan, which you've been doing periodically for the last four or five years. <clears throat> and the most recent one was a $4 million uh, infusion you did in the month of June. Also, our uh, recommendations are made, are made and uh, we feel that there's no need to increase the district's contribution based on the recommendations we have in the presentation. <clears throat> Some of the goals we had uh, uh, outlined to try to achieve with these recommendations are uh, reshuffle the cost of the consumer-driven health plan to reflect the fact that it has a lower overall average benefit costs. Currently, you've got your payroll deduction set that are almost identical between the base plan and the consumer-driven health plan. Uh, we also are recommending changing uh, some of the contributions for uh, spousal coverage within the plan, and then also a recommendation to have the district fund a health savings account that coupled with the consumer-driven health plan uh, will make the plan more desirable and uh, assist members that en enroll under that plan option with being able to pay part of their bills. So we're in full swing of the implementation process already. <clears throat> We've got uh, two things working basically, a lot of work being done by Aetna to configure your benefits, and then also uh, from your third party administrator, FBS, who drives the open Enough. enrollment education and yes, online enrollment excuse systems. Me, yes, sir. Yes, Question of my Mesa on the previous slide. So the first item listed there is to reduce plan expenses by $4 million. It says accomplished. Yes. Did I hear you say that we accomplished that just by switching the administrator and the anticipated savings? Yes, sir. So we've made improvements in uh, the cost of the administration, <clears throat> the value or the uh, claims expense. So in, in, in summary, the um, ability of Aetna's, Aetna's ability to negotiate price discounts from preferred providers outperformed the other bidders. And then another key component too <clears throat> is in your pharmacy benefit program, uh, the pharmacy benefit manager pays the district rebates based on the consumption of brand name drugs. So we saw a significant increase in the rebates that will be made available to the district, as well as improvement in the cost of claims, uh, which will uh, lower the cost of the plan by a little bit more than $4 million easily. Just the rebate part by itself is about $2 million gain, and your consumption of drugs is gonna stay pretty constant with where it was in the past. So that part works out really well for the district. Okay. It was at least a $4 million uh, that you saved by switching it to Edna, correct? Yes, sir. What was the amount actually saved? You said at least, but was it 4.5, what is it, 5 million? I don't know. Oh, uh, let's see. Thinking back to the presentation we gave you in August, I think the um, price differential, all you know, apples to apples comparison of benefits between the various uh, bidders was right about four and a half million, I think it was between four and a half, five million dollar differential compared to your results, most recent results under Cigna. So we are at a point where open enrollment, and continue on uh, slide number five, <clears throat> open enrollment is scheduled to been, begin on October the 3rd, uh, but uh, the ability of FBS to continue to prep for education, material, communication materials to support the open enrollment process, and then also on the Aetna side for, again, more educational uh, pieces and also uh, clear instructions on what benefits to build and code in their system. Uh, they're, they're basically on hold until we make some decisions on what the benefits are and, uh, and then for the communication employees, what payroll deduction costs would be. So there's a sense of urgency to make sure that we make a decision so that we can continue with open enrollment. <clears throat> open enrollment is important to have in the month of October because following that, then there'll be transmission of data back and forth between the district and your various service partners. Uh, which they will take and then as they flush out their uh, build process of the 
claims processing, processing part, they'll need to make the identification cards and get those in the hands of your employees prior to January 1st, test all the setup, make sure that it works so that on uh, January the 1st, somebody will likely find a pharmacy that's open and want to buy a prescription drug and everything needs to work on that day. So there's a lot of lead time and testing that goes into being ready for that. <clears throat> on the proposed benefits, um, excuse me. So again, uh, you currently offer three plans. They're called the premier plan, the base plan, and the high deductible health plan. And uh, effective January the 1st, we're recommending we change the name of the high deductible health plan, which is its technical name assigned by the IRS. But it's also synonymous with the consumer-driven health plan. And so that's a, a better name to call it. it. You know, high deductible just has a negative connotation to it. Consumer-driven describes the ability of inside the consumer-driven health plan, uh, the employee makes more informed decisions because they're on the hook for the deductible before benefits get paid. There's no co-pays for office visits or prescription drugs, everything's subject to the deductible. Yes? Yes, Mr. Nana, go ahead. Well, Mr. Mena, I was just in respect of time. I mean, we've heard the presentation. Yeah, I was going to yes. ask if we could just jump I, to questions. I was just going to, I was going to, okay. I was going to address that. So since we, we've heard this already in our sure. workshop. So we're can, good to can go we move to, the, to uh, maybe benefits. questions, discussion? So uh, I did do some additional math based on the discussion we had in the um, uh, workshop session uh, because we <clears> talked <throat> about the impact and I'll just go ahead and put it on the screen that shows the payroll deductions. So this is where we left off. It is slide number, you have it on paper, 16. So evidently we can't change the uh, presentation for you or give you the new information, but I did work up some different uh, numbers for you. So where we left off on payroll deductions, uh, we had the comments that none of the employee-only deductions were gonna change for the traditional PPO plan. They would be the same as what they are now, with the exception of the consumer-driven health plan. Uh, the deduction uh, for a single employee would be $30 per month instead of 60, and it would be at no cost to employees if they picked the ACO version of the consumer-driven health plan. And then as we saw on the chart, uh, the employee and child category rates actually declined slightly, but in the employee spouse, employee family, uh, categories you see on the chart how much the increase was there. So I did work up some other numbers for you for your consideration. So one would be if we followed the same strategy of not changing the payroll deduction on the PPO plan and just mm -hmm. keep it the same as what it was in this current year. So no employee would see an increase in the in the cost if we did that. So bear in mind too that uh, in our original proposal, we were proposing to lower the employee and child rate, so that would go back to where it would be. And if we did that, uh, and then, so basically, what that would do in terms of the math would mean that there's, that's a, a $1.7 million delta uh, compared to what we were targeting with our original recommendation. So in other words, as we progress through the year, it's possible the plan could outperform the expectations and maybe it saves another $1.7 million, and then there is effectively no additional subsidy from the district if you held the rates constant. If we were to follow a strategy where we said, okay, instead of the, the, what you see on the, on the board there, if we just said, okay, all deductions increase by 10%, except for the employee-only category. So you just take your last year's rate, uh, increase it by 10%, uh, then the impact in terms of additional subsidy to make that happen from the district would be $782,000 by the end of the plan year. And so then when I say, you know, to give you also the behind the math, the ACO version of payroll deductions are set at 12% below uh, what the PPO deductions would be. That's the change in the value between the ACO provider network and the open access PPO network. So in other words, if we were going to raise it 10% across the board and you decided to pick the ACO version, that brings it back down 12%. So that's effectively like no change for people that uh, would, would select the ACO version. 
<clears throat> I worked some math on another scenario to say, okay, what if we only increase the uh, cost of the spouse or tier coverages, that would be employee spouse and employee family, if we increase those by 10%, but we left the child category constant so we don't increase that, that would have a $1.2 million impact. <clears throat> and if we did a 20% increase on spousal coverage, no change on the child and everything stays the same as proposed on employee only, that would be an $842,000 impact to the district in terms of what you're effectively doing of subsidizing the cost to not raise the pay reductions as is shown on page number 16. So again, <clears throat> no change to the rates, $1.7 million impact, a 10% across the board, 782,000, 10% on spouses, no change on employee children, about 1.28 million, and 20% uh, on spouses, no change on children, 842,000. And then if you know, just picture in your head, if we increase those amounts, whatever those amounts are that we select, the ACO rates would be 12% less than that. Questions? Uh, yes. So if we uh, keep the children's rate down because it's you're, you're looking at about what twenty five dollars a month reduction on their premium employees and children and hold the other costs the same what would that result in if we kept the child rates the same if we lower the child rates and then keep the the other ones the same not increase because you're you're saying yeah your goal is to re to save four million dollars uh, you said you, with the change alone, was close to $5 million, so you achieved that. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't allowed the new changes to even take place when it comes to reducing, I'm sorry, reducing costs with the new district, with the new uh, clinic. So we haven't seen if that effect's going to happen. But by making the rate change right now with the family and the spouse, they're going to be hit with a $3,600 increase per annually for their uh, premiums. So that's, that's the given, but we haven't even seen if anything has worked that you guys are proposing here to reduce costs overall to the district. If you're gonna hit the families right away. There's 668 families that will be affected. You said it's not fair because they're married and they bring their spouse, we gotta push them off. They got there's an age factor because it costs them more and that's very discriminatory to even say that. But uh, I think we need to protect our, fam our employees here. We need to protect them because we didn't shy away when it came down to COVID relief benefits when some weren't excluded or not. We took care of them. We put the extra money aside for them to take care of the employee. And that's part of the cost of doing business for us. We need to take care of them because we just saw a lot of people retire. We have to replace them. We have to keep more people coming in to say, look, this is the best benefit we got in town. And uh, Whatever we have to do to reduce the cost on the other end after we get started, we do it. But we don't hit the employee right away with $3,600 that they expect to lose over the next fiscal year. Sure. And then I would just want to reiterate, too, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just working the math. It's, it's basically basic algebra. If we need to have a certain amount of money, then we have to charge. And, and it's not an upfront cost to the district. It's going to come over over time. You said it was yep. a $1.7 million yep. that we're looking at, but we've already save five by switching over to Aetna. So it's, it's not impossible to overcome. The district needs money to right. buy turf, we find it. We need to buy get restrooms for the gyms, we find it. We need to take care of our employees, we find it. Right, so okay. you know, there's a couple of variables that are I'm wild sorry. cards there. Uh, uh, so, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry, and I just didn't understand, I, I wanna understand what, what Mr. Castellano is saying. Are you saying for us to consider um, leaving the rates as they are, no changes? Uh, we, we can get, you know, we can look at the change for the employees and children, because they're looking at a $25 decrease monthly, 25 to 30, depending on what plan they're on. We can give them the decrease, but hold the other ones where the spouse and the spouse and family are included and just hold them the same. A $25? Yeah, whatever they, they have here for employee. Decrease on that employee and children yeah, line like across? it's a 7% decrease and, and an 11% on the base plan. Okay. So we can give them the, the right, it's a benefit for the employee. We want them to wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I got a good plan coming in January. I'm, I'm gonna be happy, I'm gonna produce, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm excited about this. 
Okay. So if I understood your question, you were saying if we, or, or the one that you asked, if we kept the rates the same with the exception of the children and we let that one be what's on the chart. Yes. Then uh, that would be about a uh, $2.1 million impact if these numbers were to happen in terms of the projections. So the, the, you know, the two wild cards that are in play here are we don't know how many people are going to choose the ACO, which is a lower cost setting, mm -hmm. and we don't know to what extent people might go to Mexico for their health care, which is also a lower cost setting. So in, as you go forward into the next year, the more people that participate in the ACO, the greater the savings would be to the district because they migrate in that direction. And the more people that access Mexican health care, uh, then the greater the savings would be. So if, you know, based on that no change figure I gave you of 1.7 million, mm. <clears throat> if we lower the payroll reductions for employee and children as described in the, in the chart, that would change that to about 2.1. And that's how much ground we would have to try to make up with the shifts in the enrollment. And that's all gonna hinge on the ability to get communication material out to employees and have them uh, sit still and listen to about the pros and cons of each of the choices that they have. And, and the enrollment teams are all poised and ready. They're, they're well aware of the meeting that's taking place tonight, <clears throat> and they're well aware of the fact that we want to strongly emphasize uh, the differences between the ACO, the Access to the Mexican Network, how the Consumer Driven Health Plan works. Because even with your own cabinet, as we went through uh, this presentation and discussion prior to even bringing it to the board, there were a lot of comments that came back from your cabinet members that said, I never really understood how this worked. I'd never had a chance to have it explained to me. So there's a need for enhanced education uh, to get out to people so that during open enrollment, they can make informed decisions and pick the choice that helps them the best. So it's, it's possible that we could get there without having the subsidy, but not knowing the answer to that many different moving parts just take a conservative approach and say that most people tend not to change their behavior too quickly. Mr. Menon, do you mind if I add a little bit to this? Go ahead. I just, I just want to be clear that the board understands. I don't, I don't know what information or the breakdown that was given years ago when the plans were developed, the premiums were, uh, were, were derived. Um, we're talking about here about using taxpayer money uh, to benefit our employees, absolutely. But the dollars we're talking about right now are ta using taxpayers' money to offset or subsidize health care for non-employees, for spouses. And so if the board chooses to do that, and to spend up to $2.1 million to do so, uh, just need to be transparent that those funds are being used, taxpayers' funds, to pay health care for, for spouses, not for employees. And the plan that was brought to you by Randy, uh, the administration reviewed, shifts the burden of the cost to those that are actually using and benefiting from the health care. So mathematically, it, it works out. It, it shifts the burden to where it belongs, based on who's using it. If you choose to use taxpayers' funds to pay uh, health care for spouses, that certainly is at the uh, discretion of the board. Well, we're using taxpayer funds to pay for their children, and they may not even be students in the district, you know? Actually, I think if you look at Randy's numbers there, you're spending about $200 on average per, per child, and I think the, um, the premiums are close to that number, $226 per child versus $673 per spouse. Um, the premiums did not reflect that difference. I think it's why our premiums for spouses or employee and family were so much lower than area districts and districts across the state. Again, the board has the discretion to approve over premiums, whatever plan they choose to do so, but those funds would be then used to offset or subsidize, continue to subsidize or offset uh, non-employees and spouses. Quick question. Uh, what is the percentage of these individuals, these spouses? I mean, is there, did you break it down to as far as the employee and spouse? I think it was in a slide previously. What is that percentage? I don't have those numbers right oh. in front of me, but I, I think you can tell from the slide that's up there uh, right now, this is just part of, the, of a bigger grid. So the answer to the question is, uh, you can see there's the average spouse costs 673, and there's 670 of them. So 670 times 673 times 12 is what the spouses cost. And then the same math on the others. So there's a much lower percentage of spouses enrolled than employees. 
So the percentage of the total is actually pretty small. And that's why it's, it's obviously more expensive because it's not a high percentage. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's more expensive for two mm -hmm. fundamental reasons. Number one is, and use myself as an example, if I'm employed here and my spouse is employed at El Paso ISD, then, uh, then we can make a decision. Do we want to cover each other under our health plans? Or maybe uh, at El Paso ISD, uh, I don't, you know, it's the benefit versus the payroll deduction is not as good as the benefit versus payroll deduction here. So that promotes what's called adverse selection, is that a normal, logical decision-making process would say, this is going to be the best deal for me. I'm going to move my risk from this employer to that employer. So when your benefits are better on average than other people, and it's not just in the public sector, but in the private sector too, and when your payroll deductions are lower, then that attracts that risk into your plan and that creates adverse selection. And then that's what that, what, what that means is that if, I'm, if it's a situation where my spouse is extremely healthy and she never uses benefits, and I might say, you know, it's just not worth it. I don't want to add her here. There's not a need. But if I have a spouse that consumes a lot of health care, then I would say, yeah, I should put them on here. Now I have two plans to pay, and I pay the freight in terms of deductions for that because I have a lot of expenses that I want the plan to pay for me. So it attracts the higher risk into the group when you have a, a selection like that. For your own employees, the pay reduction is pretty low. And even under the consumer-driven health plan now, you're going to have an option that's free. So there's, you know, for people that could not afford insurance at all, now they could at least enroll in the consumer-driven health plan, receive the $600 in case they have an expense. And if they want to put more money in there, they can do that. And that promotes healthier people to join the plan. Because people that don't join the plan for $60 a month, whether it's the base plan or whatever, <clears throat> they're probably making a decision that I don't see that it's worth $60 for me to have health insurance. And in that case, that's, they're probably thinking they're not much of a risk. But if they knew that they had diabetes or other health conditions, then they'll jump all over $60. That's a bargain to have the health plan back you up on unpredictable catastrophic expenses that might happen. So spouses by design are typically adversely selected against the group, and that's why uh, their, their cost of claims compared to their peers like employees is generally higher. Mr. Morales, we're just asking about the percentage of employees who uh, are insured, who, who insure their spouse or family. Is that, was that the yeah, question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it. out of 5,302 people who take our insurance, 210 um, insure their spouse also. It's right at 4%. Uh, 458 out of the 5302 insure their entire families, 8.6%. So 12.6% of our employees uh, between those two alternatives uh, insure their spouse with SISD insurance. 668. Uh, you also mentioned that the changes in the plan may not even incur, have, may not necessitate a subsidy later on just because of the way people may change how they enroll in the plan too, right? In but the short term, it could, it yes. could generate those results. In the we long just, term, we'll have inflation continually impact the plan in terms of the cost of drugs and the cost of consumption of hair care. But the, uh, the one thing we do know if we keep the cost like this and pass it is that 668 employees will have you know, a, a minimum of $3,600 increase in their health care because they bring a fam another family member across to help them, you know, for health care or whatever the reason, you know. So yeah, it's an extremely or they, large or they number of variables plan. that impact the right. Or they could cost. select a different plan or they could go with their spouse's work. I mean, there are other options. It's not necessarily a given that they would increase by 3600 a year. Well, um, if they stayed on the exact same plan, yes, sir, that would be the, that would be the impact. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the plan with the cost as is, uh, except uh, the recommended reductions for employees and children um, take effect. I make that recommendation. I make that motion. Motion is for the rates to remain Same. as they are, except the employee, employee and children, and children which, which would be reduced by, how much? by twenty-five dollars for would? each. What's respective in the plan here? Yeah. Plan. Okay. Second. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Castiano and a, and a second by Mr. Uh, Mr. Nakeda. As so mentioned, the plan 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Quick question. Yes, Mr. Mayor, let's go what, ahead. What is that impact? How is that going to impact the district as far as financial? If it follows the uh, everybody pretty well stays where they are and continues their same habit, then that would be about a 2.29 or $2.19 million potential subsidy that would be needed by the end of the year. It wouldn't necessarily happen in the first month or the second month. You'll need to see the claims data start to come in. And then we will we'll know at about month number six or number seven how the trends are developing and then be able to tell you if it looks like there's gonna be a need for any other type of infusion uh, before the end of the plan year. So it's not like you're gonna wake up in February and say, oops, gotta find $2 million and put it in there. It will, it will accumulate over time. That assumes that there's gonna be no improved use of the clinic. That assumes that you know, everything stays as it is. Improvement on prescription drugs. Yeah, but again, okay. yeah, the more people that go I to the ACO or go to Mexico, the better it will be for financially for the district. Go ahead. Or the, and the clinic. So well, I wanna clarify the motion because I think the motion is just talking about the premier plan. It's not talking about you know, all, all three plans. All of them. Yes, all Everything of them. stays at it, as is. But you said the twenty. The the verbiage that was said was the twenty five dollars, but that's only on the. No, premier. it's a reduction that's re reflected in the plan for children and employee. So the children and employee line. That's what that's what I'm trying to clarify. Going all the way across, the that's green number would reduce by twenty five dollars. It it varies. It's it one seven point six percent. That's what I'm asking for clarification. It varies, but. So the way I'm understanding this is twenty five dollars across. The no. No. It. it Oh, it varies. Okay. That's it why varies I want the clarification so we get and I resend my motion second. for you clarification. Resend, you resend your motion? My, my second. I didn't make the motion. Mr. Castellano did, but I just resend the second so we can get clarification on exactly. It was the, the previous cost, but where employees and children come in, we, we, we uh, respect the changes where it's because it's a reduction for the employees. Okay, so the motion is you want to leave? The employee, children, reduction. The, the costs all the that. premiums the same across all the plans yes is that going to be your motion allow the children plan to follow the the, the, recommended, the recommended reductions recommended reductions second that that's what i want to clarify took my second did <laughs> you rescinded it well i did because i wanted clarification i wanted to be sure that what his motion sorry but that's okay so that's i have okay. a second for Mr. Barrera now <laughs> Could I offer yes, a translation of what I believe he, he said? So, in other words, for across all the plans, <clears throat> we keep the pay reductions from the for the traditional PPO plans constant with what they are right now, with the exception of the employee child rate, which would follow the rates on this table. And then the next part would be, and then set the ACO equivalent deductions 12% lower than what I just said. And that now you covered every category. Does that sound that right? right? Is that? That sounds right. That sounds yeah, right? It, we're approving something we're not, we're not sure about. I'm not sure about it now. I'm confused. <laughs> okay. uh, now I'm confused. So we got to get yeah, this clear. It's, it, okay. All right, guys, we're going to move forward. <laughs> got to get it cleared here. So are you, do you, are you okay, Dave? I'm, I'm asking for clarification. It seems to me like it's all the ACO. You're saying yeah. one thing, he's saying another. So we're trying to trying to so figure it out. All payroll deductions stay exactly the same as what they are on the traditional PPO plans, okay. on and all then plans. On all uh, plans. employee and child rates would be, follow the rates presented on slide 16 of this presentation. Wait a minute, Randy. On all plans, not just the PPO plan. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, all of them. Uh, all plans. On all plans, yes, but the ACO. On the all, and all, all the P, all you, three you of the PPO, PPO plans. You said PPO only. Yeah, P, uh, the traditional PPOs. Okay. And then we set the ACO rates 12% below what you adopted for the PPO okay. rates. Are we, I guess. Yes. That makes sense. Are we yeah, good? Makes sense. David, you're good? Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Castellano and now a second by Mr. Barrera to what was just said. <laughs> and discussed right now. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 
motion carries. All right. Great. Well, thank you for your decision. Thank we'll you. get work on the education and the communication <laughs> process. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay, consider going down to item E, consider approval of updates to compensation plan. Administration recommends consideration and approval of items as presented by Mrs. Selena Stiles. Hi, Welcome. good evening, President Mena. Dr. Carmen, members of the board, I'm Selena Stiles, Director of Human Resources for Support Personnel. And the first item in, on the agenda is supplemental pay for athletic events, and that starts on page 458. And I am going to turn it over to Mr. J.J. Calderon. Good evening, President Mena, members of the board, Dr. Carmen, uh, J.J. Calderon, Director of Athletics. Uh, athletics would like to propose an increase to the flat rate fees that are paid to game workers at athletic events on six of our high school campuses, for games at the SAC, and for district hosted meets. I believe the proposed amounts are on page 473 and 474 of your board book. Uh, this would include game managers, ticket takers, scorekeepers, official bookkeepers, announcers, meet directors, meet judges uh, that are paid per game amounts that include single and multiple game rates. Uh, increase, increases range anywhere from 7 to $20 more per game, and the financial impact would be an increase of $6,000 to $10,000 uh, per site. Uh, financial Services has indicated at two board committee meetings last week that we should be able to stay within budget with this increase. Any questions? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Castellano, a second by Mr. Morales. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we we'll move on to executive session. No, wait, sir. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Wishful thinking. Nurse, <laughs> nurses aid supplement pay. Yes, sir. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cruz. Good evening, Board President Mena, members of the board, and Dr. Carmen. Um, this is a recommendation for an increase to for our nurse aides who are substituting for a an LVN or an RN. Um, it's an additional two hours of their daily rate. Excuse me, of their hourly rate. It would begin on the 11th day and then retro retroactive pay to the first day, um, and it would be a lump sum payment at the semester. This is Questions. for any of our nurse aides who will be, who substitute for our nurses. Question. Yes. Go ahead. So if we look at substitute nurses for the same item, we pay them $50 an hour, which is almost at the max. LVNs is almost the same. Why wouldn't we not just give the nurses aides time and a half? Uh, time and a half is a, an hourly issue. If they are working over 40 hours, that is, we can't, we can't pay time and a half unless it's a, we're setting the okay, hourly rate. Okay, so let me say it differently. Why not pay them instead of $2, the equivalent of what, be t what would be time and a half, which would be $7.25? So we can pay nurses $50, and LVNs almost as much, which, by the way, those are substitutes, right? Substitutes. Mm -hmm. And that is in excess of the maximum rate for a staff nurse, not a substitute. If, if we had the nurse sitting there, that $50 exceeds the max rate for that pay scale. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. But I think I did the math correctly. So why not set the equivalent rate? Because they're filling in for a nurse, right? I mean, we're not gonna pay them $50, but what's wrong with giving them an extra 725, which would be the equivalent? And, and that's at the discretion of the board. I mean, this is a recommendation that we brought based on um, it being uh, halfway between the um, medical assistant max and the LVN minimum, so that there would be no compression between pay grades. Um, that's simply a recommendation. Sounds to me like it also gives us an incentive to fill the position quickly. Any other questions? Motion to establish the supplemental pay rate for nurses' aides to 
the standard rate 1550 plus 725. So the additional rate would be 725. Right? So it would add 725 to their standard rate. Instead of the two dollars, it would be seven twenty-five. Catch, yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. So I have a motion by Mr. Nagera and a second by Ms. Nagera. To establish the new rate of fifteen fifty. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Just for clarification, it's instead of the two dollars proposed. Yes. To seven twenty-five, seven dollars and twenty-five cents. To add in addition, to add instead of the two dollars proposed, a seven twenty-five correct per hour. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, moving on to substitute pay, Monday and Friday. Hi, good evening again. Yes, this evening I'll be presenting the change um, to the substitute pay for Mondays and Fridays. Currently, we're paying a flat rate of $150 regardless of the rate that the substitute currently holds. So our plan is to increment their current rate by $50 on Mondays and Fridays. So those substitutes that currently earn $100 a day will continue to earn the $150, but those that earn $125 will earn $175, and those that are at $150 will earn $200. Questions? Motion to approve. Second. So a motion by Mr. Barrera, a second by Mr. Morales. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we can go into executive session. Meeting is to be closed for consultation with legal counsel regarding pursuing sanctions against employee SL for abandonment of employee contract to discuss personnel and real estate matters to consider administrative recommendations for director of purchasing, director of transportation, Dean of Instructions at El Dorado High School under the Texas Government Code Section 551071, 551072, and 551074, and the time is 7.02. Oh, two. I'm looking at this. I wish it was seven. I wish. <laughs> 902.
We are back. The time is 9.37. New business. A, discussion and possible action regarding pursuing sanctions against employee SL for abandonment of employment contract. Go ahead, Bob. Yes, members of the board, it is recommended that the board consider a motion to report to, report to ASPEC <clears throat> Stephen Lefebvre as abandoning his contract without good cause and that the district seek sanctions against his certificate. So move. Second. So I have a motion by Mr. Najera and a second by Ms. Najera. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Item number B, consider approval of administrative recommendations. Presenter, Dr. Nick Carmen. President Menem, members of the board, administration rec recommends Gabriela Garcia to assume the role and responsibilities as the new director of purchasing of financial services. Motion to approve. Second. Second. So I have a motion by Mr. Barrera, a second by Mr. Morales. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay. President Manning, members of the board, administration recommends Dexter Harmon to assume the role and responsibilities as the new director of transportation of administrative services. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Barrera, a second by Mr. Castellano. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. President Mena and members of the board, administration recommends Ana Solis to assume the role and responsibilities as the new Dean of Instruction of El Dorado High School. Motion to approve. Second. So I have a motion by Mr. Morales, a second by Mr. Bar Barrera. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Mena? Uh, yes. If we can uh, revisit item 9B1, it's a change to policy DC local? Yes, ma'am. I, Mr. Ramirez, can you talk about that or? Mrs. Mr. Ramirez or Dr. Cruz? Yes, Dr. Cruz will uh, uh, clarify that matter for you. I was just okay. going to mention that yes, you are guys. within your rights to reconsider that. Okay. Thank you, Board President Mena, members of the board, Dr. Carmen. Um, I'm respectfully requesting reconsideration of revisions to DC local. Uh, for the reason that we do have an urgent need for this change. Um, what this ma change would allow, um, it would allow us to hire teachers, well not us, Dr. Carmen, uh, it would give him the authority to hire teachers um, in between board meetings. You know, as it is right now, um, all recommendations come to the board. Um, this revision states the board retains final authority for employment of all administrative positions. The board delegates to the superintendent final authority to, for new employment of all other contractual personnel. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to DFBB local where it states and highlighted under superintendent's recommendation, the superintendent shall prepare lists of employees whose contracts are recommended for renewal or proposed re non-renewal by the board. So every year, those lists of uh, educators, of employees that are traditionally brought to the board for renewal or non-renewal, that will continue. Right. This revision to DC Local is only addressing new hires. So if we get somebody, if we get somebody through mid-year, say June, we can hire, Dr. Carmen can hire them instead of having to wait till the end of the year. Yes. Because somebody else will pick them up then, right? So let's say between now and our next board meeting, we have a teacher that we interview and mm -hmm. you know they have the appropriate certification, we can bring them on board. Uh, we have such a need for teachers right now that it behooves us to make this change so that we can bring them on board with Dr. Carmen's authority and get them in a classroom to service our students. Right, but I think the point is that the, the additional language is already in DFBB. Those renewals yes, sir, do come you. to the board annually. So it's covered yes. in DFB, DFBB local. That was my concern. Okay. Motion, motion to, to approve. approve. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Barrera, a second by Ms. Najera. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. All right, guys. Thank you, board. And I believe that is it. Board, please. Lord have mercy. Okay. Motion to adjourn. The time is 942.